So, good morning. Happy Jamahuri Day. Thank you for coming and attending this third day of our e commerce week. Um, the session that we're going to run now um, for the next three hours, in principle, although there's no problem with us finishing a bit earlier, if that's the case, it depends on a number of things. It depends on the speakers we've got here that are coming from an earlier session, and it depends on the degree to which you want to discuss with us. And of course, we're very happy to discuss the topic with you, which is on the topic of fostering skills for the digital economy in Africa. Now, the last few days, uh, we've heard a number of references to this topic of skills. So in fact, we're in this area, which is the complement of the debate on the importance of hard infrastructure, the famous digital divide, and how important is it in stimulating the growth of e-commerce and all the benefits that we want to see out of it, uh, which, is the p the, which is the power to engage in productive economic activity through trade and the resulting creation of wealth, hopefully, uh, and jobs, uh, which can hopefully be inclusive. So we see this as a, as a goal for what we want to do with e-commerce, but we, reali we realize more and more that there are a number of things that we need to do to invest in as an international community, as regional communities, as governments and other stakeholders to make this vision possible that e-commerce can contribute to our development objectives. So we're in the area of soft infrastructure, you may say, with skills. Um, clearly, by investing more and more in the digital pipeline, uh, we're not so sure what will come out of it if the basic skills and capabilities are not there. So we hear a lot about this. And certainly there was a, a group of us who were here in July at an African Union uh, conference on the African continental free trade area and uh, the uh, particular relevance of e-commerce. And this was also very present in the room and, and around the discussions we had, the importance of skills. Uh, but a lot that I observe in that debate is often ambiguous or not well defined. We know it's important, but different people mean different things, what they mean by skills. And we should, we should be clear in this which public we're talking about, which group of people, um, because there are different levels to this. And we realize that there is a relevant understanding and relevant capabilities which are necessary, should we say, from policy makers, those who are in charge of understanding the importance of this and what can be done about it, perhaps institutions and other, other organizations which can support policymakers, the business community itself, and of course the, the population at large, which can cover a wide variety of skills from simple uh, digital literacy to more advanced skills. But perhaps for us here, and certainly on the panel, we have a, we have a number of entrepreneurs who can debate this topic with us. The principal vector that we would, we would talk about uh, is the business community. It's the one that is central to actually making money out of this. And so core to the topic this morning a little bit is what, what is that? What are the business skills which is necessary? What do, we actually, what, what, what do we actually mean by this and what's missing? So to help me uh, uh, explore this topic and perhaps put some more detail on it, I have a number of speakers. There are, there are four here. There are, there are possibly a couple more uh, going to come. Um, but let me just make a, 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 a few introductions uh, for you who we've got here. So on the far end, uh, we have um, um, Adam uh, Grunewald, who is the CEO and uh, co-founder of link.co.ke, uh, which is a Kenyan-based company. And um, it's a technology platform uh, that offers the infrastructure for the informal sector workers to succeed in the gig economy. So Adam started at Google and was able to develop his experience there. And while working at Google in Kenya, Adam came face to face with the, the, the significant challenges and opportunities 
uh, that exist in the co country's informal uh, labor sector. And at the end of 2005, he founded Link, uh, and he's been following this as passion ever since. So we'll hear from, from Adam a little bit about that experience, and there's a lot of rich experience there, both as an entrepreneur uh, in, his, uh, in his own right and with his company, but also understanding the skills in Kenya and beyond. So um, uh, the next, to, next to Adam is uh, Stella, and Stella is from, uh, you is from Uganda, and she's in charge of e-learning and training pro projects at Zimba Women. Um, and heads the operations of Zimbama e-commerce platform, uh, which entails, uh, which is focused on SMEs for women entrepreneurs, and I, uh, handles IT training projects, business training, networking events, and capacity building. And so she's also founder of a digital marketing firm which supports SMEs um, in, in areas such as content writing uh, and report writing, and gives uh, advises on digital and IT services. Uh, uh, in Uganda. So next we have uh, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Rasugu, who's um, the director of Mobile for Development, Sub-Saharan Africa with GSMA. And Jeremy has the primary responsibility for identifying opportunities uh, for social, economic, environmental impact uh, to stimulate the development of uh, scalable mobile services in Sub-Saharan Sub-Saharan Africa region. And prior to GSMA, Jeremy was technical lead at uh, Include Solutions. Um, and he has a, a wealth of experience in uh, the, the branchless banking area, um, and notably was involved in M-Pesa, where he pioneered the setup of uh, the agent network in Kenya for M-Pesa. Um, and the moment on my left is the final speaker. Um, we, we have uh, Derek uh, Maturi, uh, who's founder and CEO of Herdy.co. Um, uh, Herdy is an online market that provides uh, valuable opportunities to the agri-business value chain uh, by eliminating middlemen and sourcing fresh produce directly from farmers to consumers. And uh, Derek was made aware of this opportunity at a time where he was asked by a platform to set up a business supplying rabbit meat. And uh, this didn't work out, uh, and, and Derek tried to transfer the opportunity through Facebook and found that this was very limiting but in terms of its scope and what he could do, so founded his own platform, Herdy, uh, to take up the opportunity. Um, so with, um, I, before I hand over to, um, to Adam, um, i just say a few um, opening comments about this area of skill. So um, my name is James Howe. Um, I work for the International Trade Center. And in ITC, I do a few things, but the one that's important for today is running uh, our e-commerce projects, um, including projects in Africa, where what we do is support groups of SMEs, uh, institutions, and other partners, including platforms, to improve their skills. It's one of the things that we work on, but also uh, develop um, shared solutions, which can help them uh, get online, list their prod pr products, and do other things like manage payment solutions and logistics. So as an um, international organization, we also wanted to understand this, uh, this area of skills and what was the barrier. So at the beginning of last year, we launched a survey uh, through our network of trade support institutions around the world. Experience, why in particular taking this focus on companies, which is our principal viewpoint into this, of what small companies need to do. And we, we surveyed developed countries and developing countries, including many across Africa. And we found there were a lot of shared problems about from the very beginning of understanding e-commerce and its opportunities. We found that companies lacked an awareness of what the right products were for the right markets, indeed understanding how to get on those marketplaces. And uh, in particular, the African countries experienced a lot of problems early on in establishing their businesses, 
being able to properly list and get access, more so than in developed countries, which is not so surprising uh, when we understand that in many countries in Africa, it's very difficult, for instance, to receive uh, money internationally to have so-called merchant accounts with, with the payment solutions providers. So um, the results of this survey have allowed us to a bit quantify the problem, which we already knew very well from our work in the field. So we have field experience across various a African countries. Even for us, and here uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Mar um, uh, uh, Martin from um, uh, um, Jumia, who's on the panel, I heard him mention yesterday that Africa, that e-commerce is new in Africa since six years. I'm not sure what his beginning point was for e-commerce in Africa, but it does feel new in, Afri in Africa. And as our executive director said on Monday morning, it's as if Africa actually faces it. It's not so much the fourth industrial revolution, but the first digital revolution. And Africa has a lot of opportunities to make use of this. So it feels like it's late in late versus what's happening in developed countries for e-commerce. But Africa is finding new, new ways of doing e-commerce. And I think that that needs to be strengthened. So in our work, we, we like to bring to, together some uh, supporting initiatives, um, as I mentioned. And these can be from quite, basic, from a quite a basic level, but it's what's needed in terms of understanding how to describe the company and its products, how to write attractive listings, understanding e-commerce business models, uh, maintaining and managing inventories. Now that sounds very advanced, but in a way it can begin from a, a, a very simple basis of understanding what the products are that need to be produced, how to describe them, label them, and ensure that there is consistent production and availability of them to be able to sell online. So these are just some of the lessons which are quite, you could almost call them basic, but there's quite a journey to be made uh, by, by many, many African businesses as they learn what's required. So there are digital skills, which is about understanding these marketplaces and some of the technical things that I think we can mention, but there's a whole lot more to this in order to be able to succeed in e-commerce, something that looks deceptively simple, because of all of us uh, can go on uh, a platform and see photos of products and companies, and it looks like it should be very, very easy, but in many cases, it's not so easy. So we pursue that work, and we have a number of, uh, we have a number of projects across Africa. Perhaps our biggest project at the current time is in, is in Rwanda. Uh, we, we have a major undertaking to work with 150 companies, which we're coaching through the various stages of getting online. We're working with marketplaces, uh, the local marketplaces to engage with them on what it means to conduct effectively uh, e-commerce and support the local companies in doing that. Uh, we're working with institutional partners to bring them this practical understanding and complement the strategy that the, the government of Rwanda is uh, putting, putting forward. And we we'll also have a major initiative in the logistics space with one of our project partners, which is uh, uh, DHL. And together with our uh, delivery partner, GIZ, um, we are building a, uh, a facility, which is a warehousing facility and logistics facility, which helps uh, companies have access to affordable logistics solutions, but more than that, have primary support in advising them on things like packaging, labeling, and even photographing their products. So this is a model that we're setting up and seeing what we can do with it in Rwanda. If you're interested in that, I won't speak much more about that unless you have specific questions, but I do have a session this afternoon at three o'clock that's specifically about that project and what it means. So that's enough from me on my introduction. And now I'd like to uh, pass it over uh, in particular to Adam. Adam, thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, it's it's early in the morning. I think this is the first session, and it's also a holiday in Kenya for for those that aren't from here. So I'll try to make this as interesting as possible. And I think the way that I'll I'll do that is I'll I'll try to be the most controversial speaker. Okay, I I, I promise to be the most controversial. So I'm going to try to pose some questions that maybe can inform the debate or discussion that we'll have. So I encourage people to to ask clarifying questions or challenge or or whatever else. Um, just by way of introduction. So my name is Adam. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company here called Link. Uh, I've been in Kenya for the last six years. My background is in technology. I worked at Google in San Francisco as well as here in Kenya um, as a product manager uh, and then 
fell in love with the opportunity related to the informal sector. So um, at Link, we are a technology platform, but I guess our, our, our true north, our mission, is around how we can create careers and income improvements for informal sector workers, right? People that look like this, um, right? Informal sector workers, right? Maybe this is a plumber or a beautician or a carpenter or a tailor or, or whatever else. Um, here in Kenya, the informal sector, right? So people that work in non-salaried or non-wage jobs represents about 80% of the working population, right? So it's a massive, massive, massive sector, right? These are, these are maybe, SMEs, but uh, maybe right before someone would become an SME, often people in the informal sector do employ other people that, that, that help them work, right? A carpenter might have helpers, right? Or, or, or other things like that, although they might not identify themselves as an SME. So we work with informal sector workers and we see how we can build careers and livelihoods for informal sector workers. I'll give a little bit of background on what we do at Link and what we've learned over the last three years, what we've accomplished, what we failed at. <laughs> um, uh, and, and then, as I said, bring up a few discussion questions that maybe can be answered by the brilliant people speaking after me or, or discussed and debated together. Um, so the first thing that we do is we don't build clickers, because... <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to, to give a, a bit of a sense. So it, it's estimated that, that the informal sector represents more than a third of the GDP of Kenya, right? And, and again, the primary employer within the, the country. And, and this is the same in Kenya as well as in other markets. Um, we, we, we think a lot about uh, whether or not the key is to try to formalize all of these workers, right? Teach them all to be entrepreneurs or independent contractors, all the skills that they might be missing around economics or photography or copywriting or marketing or whatever else are we likely to be able to endow these individuals with all of those skills that allows them to be competitive? Um, or, or are there ways that this can be subsidized? Um, the first thing that we ever built at, at Link, and the reason that we chose the name Link, was uh, we, we said in the informal sector, and, and again, what we see on most e-commerce platforms or uh, most marketplaces, is there needs to be some element of career identity, right? Um, we know when we're looking for employees or giving work to people within our companies that we can look at a CV or a LinkedIn profile in order to understand that this person qualified for this job is the outputs of their labor likely to be satisfactory or fulfill what I need. Um, but actually in the informal sector, th there is really no LinkedIn, right? What, what is this LinkedIn for the linked out? Um, and, and actually the, the first thing that we built, we said the foundation is, is knowing what individuals can do, what makes them unique or special or competitive um, and being able to display that, right? This is an example of one of the carpenters on our platform. His name is Julius. Uh, we have a lot of information about him, about how many jobs he accomplishes, what customers have to say about them, pictures of the work that he's done. A and we find that this is able to help Julius earn more work over time and earn more money for the work that he does. The second thing that we do on our platform is we connect people to work opportunities, right? So now that we know that Julius is a carpenter, Julius has specialty in making chairs or tables or uh, small craft goods. Um, when there are requests from businesses or households that need these sorts of services, we're able to use a technology platform in order to understand the request, the scope of the need of that customer. We're able to understand the details um, and, and then source that request to Julius, therefore maybe unlocking markets that he would have otherwise struggled to access um, or um, collecting more information than he would have otherwise been able to get. Uh, additionally, um, other ways that we can help Julius earn work is using an e-commerce platform. We specifically focus on made to order or artisan made e-commerce. So um, maybe a, a distinction would be as Amazon in the United States is to Etsy in the United States. Um, but, but again, to, to clarify further, all of the items that would be for sale on our e-commerce platform would be things that are handmade by local artisans and are made to order. So, so they're, they're starting... I think this went off. Oh, there it goes. Um, so for example, we don't sell phones that might be manufactured overseas or uh, toilet paper or, or, or whatever else, right? These are uh, artisan-made products. So generally things like uh, clothing, apparel, furniture, jewelry, etc. 
We also are able to connect workers on the platform to high value projects, right? So our, our theory is whether Julius is doing a job making a table on order for an individual, fulfilling an order that's come from the items that he has listed on our shop, or whether he's working to help on a construction site, right? As long as he's able to get consistent work, um, you know, five or six days of the week, that's giving him consistent income, um, that, that this is a success. Beyond that, though, we've also realized, so, so I guess just to give a little bit of context, um, in the last two years, we've completed about 25,000 job engagements. Uh, we have 1,400 workers earning income on our platform every month. Uh, this last year, we paid out about $2 million to informal sector workers, and that number should uh, in increase quite substantially next year in 2019. Uh, so some of the things that, that we've learned um, is that you know just matching people to job opportunities is often not enough, right? Julius maybe lacks the tools. Um, you know, I, I showed pictures of, of the workshop that Julius worked in, but you know, actually Julius didn't have a workshop when he joined the platform, right? He, he borrowed space from someone else. Julius had only hand to tools, no machine operated tools, right? No electric screwdriver or saw or drill or, or, or anything else, right? Which makes it very difficult for him to keep up with orders, maintain quality or, or whatever else, right? So we have also tool loan or borrowing programs within the platform um, as we see that this is critical to success. I don't know if there's like a specific <laughs> form that I need to use. To <laughs> Could you just push the button? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our system also uses things like automated SMSs or even uh, a mobile application that workers on the platform can use in order to get information, get reminders, get training, um, receive feedback or ratings or, or anything else, right? So whether Julius prefers to be communicated to via SMS or via mobile application, he gets details of job requests, he gets details of whether or not he's won that job request, he gets details of, of payments and, and everything else. Um, within Link, w w we say that one of our goals to help individuals like Julius is to build infrastructure that helps him be a successful entrepreneur. Sometimes this is skill training. However, there are areas where skill training we feel is often not enough, right? Um, an example would be uh, the items that, that Julius makes uh, in order to be effectively sold in an e-commerce setting probably need to be photographed in a very beautiful and attractive way. Um, and so we explored for a while trying to train carpenters on how to take really beautiful photographs, uh, and, and we failed after trying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, with hundreds and hundreds of, of workers. Um, th there's a lot of, you know, just institutional or infrastructural challenges, right? Can, can Julius afford a, a you know, high resolution camera, right? Can he charge that camera? <laughs> can he, fix the camera if it breaks or protect it from being stolen? Can he get effective lighting or backdrops, et cetera? And, and we said, actually, it's, it's substantially less costly for us to in-house a photographer and, and take photographs for all the carpenters on our platform instead of trying to teach all of them to take effective photographs, right? Um, so some of this entrepreneurship infrastructure we provide as a platform, and, and some of it um, workers are responsible for on their own. We see a lot of platforms in other parts of the world uh, and in fact, in, in many developed markets where a lot of these platforms are, are popping up first, they're often quite controversial, right? Um, things like Uber maybe create races to the bottom where prices are under minimum wage or where there's competition between different platforms that um, you know, create controversy. Uh, I, I think the challenges here are actually quite different, right? Um, informal sectors within the UK or, or Canada or other places are, are not large. In fact, most people operate in the formal sector and, and, and have a wage job. And it's often a, a decision, an explicit decision to say, I would prefer to work in the gig economy rather than work in the formal economy because the gig economy gives me freedom or um, choice over my schedule or, or where I work, as opposed to in a market where people are already working in the informal economy or a gig economy and maybe a platform organizes it better. So we're, we're big believers in the power of platforms in the power of marketplaces and the power of using gig work in order to help give people consistent or improved income over time. And we're big believers in collecting information and using transparency in order to you know, 
uh, uh, help create a meritocracy, essentially, where very good, high-performing workers can earn more money over time. Um, but we, we do see a, a number of challenges, and I'm excited to, to hear from great people with experience or, or, or discuss this as a group. Uh, I, I have three discussion questions that I want to leave with. Um, you know, um, is e-commerce specifically, and, and e-commerce as a whole, you know, e-commerce e is often the sale of manufactured goods, right? The, the biggest sellers on something like a Jumia or an Amazon or, or whatever else are often manufactured goods. Are these indeed tools for development? The second question is, um, does the gig economy or e-commerce create a race to the bottom? And the third one, oh. The third one is whether or not these skills are better to be trained to the individual or to be absorbed by the platform. From what we've seen on e-commerce being a tool for development, uh, we see that essentially, you know, when you, e-commerce e e is, is very much capitalism in, in, in a very pure form, right? Like, um, as you break down barriers and borders and things like that, and you, you, you bring in other players that are able to sell against you, um, th th then you very much need things like competitive differentiators. T to be very honest, in, in Kenya, some, a lot of very, very large businesses are, are, are built on the fact that there was not a lot of competition, right? That something could be imported from a market that other people didn't have access to, and the price could be increased by 200 or 300 percent, right? A, a lot of businesses are, are built on this foundation, and e-commerce breaks that down. It's great for the consumer, but naturally, uh, it can have challenges for the merchant, right? Um, in the case of someone that has a, a, a cell phone store, a small cell phone store, this is an SME, um, they import you know, cell phones from manufacturers, maybe overseas, yet when a pure e-commerce player comes and then that manufacturer can sell directly through that e-commerce platform, this small SME right, might, might be otherwise very, very challenged to be competitive in that case. Um, another challenge around e-commerce that, that we personally experience is in most e-commerce platforms, the customer expects consistency of quality, right? If I order toothpaste from an e-commerce platform and each tube of toothpaste has a different amount of toothpaste in it, or like the color of toothpaste is different, right? I'll probably be upset and I'll send back <laughs> this toothpaste, um, which means then that, that the, the participants, the merchants in these e-commerce platforms need the infrastructure to one, maintain quality consistently over time, right? Julius needs to be able to get the same wood and the same finish and the same grain and the same texture consistently, right? In order to not have frustrated customers. But even beyond that, um, you know, with e-commerce, right? We want same day delivery, right? We, we want within 24 hours, we want predictable delivery windows. So this means that also uh, these SMEs or these participants, these merchants need the capacity to keep up with these very aggressive order timelines, right? This requires a lot of infrastructure that we see that a lot of at least people that we work with do not have. And then the third one is very real risks, as I said, from international competition, right? Um, you, you, you very much feel what is there a competitive advantage for? You know, I, in Kenya, we have competitive advantages in a lot of different areas, right? But, but maybe not in the manufacture of phones or, or other electronics, right? And, and then for all the SMEs that are participating in those industries, what does it mean for them? The second question is, is there a race to the bottom? Um, so we do a lot of analysis around pricing. Um, we have you know, in-house data scientists and quantitative economists that are able to get some really inter interesting information, right? I think on our platform, we know, you know average prices that people are willing to pay for plumbers or housekeepers you know, based on different geographic areas. It's really interesting. Um, and what we found is actually races to the bottom exist usually in scenarios where there is not a transparency of information. If you don't know that the work that this painter is going to do will be quality or not quality, right, will, will, will be a good paint job or a not good paint job, then your, your, your decision is often made based on, therefore, what is the cheapest possible painting job that, that I can get, right? Um, so where there is not market transparency or information, there's a race to the bottom. Additionally, where there's not a lot of existing regulation, there can be a race to the bottom. For example, things like minimum wage laws, right, or, 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 or quality standards that are done through um, certificate or um, like certifying programs, you can have races to the bottom because you know, there's not, nothing to say, hey, you can't employ this person for less than you know, $3, $5 an hour. Um, and, and ultimately, when these don't exist, right, the, these systems of regulation or this transparency, platforms are often the ones, or the private sector as a whole is often the one that therefore steps in to fill it. Right? They need to create competitive differentiators, and sometimes it is price, but otherwise they have the burden of differentiating themselves via discussion of quality or consistency or, or, or whatever else. So I think this is actually a huge opportunity uh, and a responsibility of platforms that pop up in order to set 
the sorts of standards that could prevent a race to the bottom. And then the, the, the final question, and again, this is one that, that we, we ask ourselves very often, uh, is whether or not SMEs or informal sector workers can get enough skill training to be competitive, right? That this can be, as, as James was asking, a tool for development and, and growth within countries, or is this something that, that presents a risk, right? And so um, it, it's, a, it's a big question, right? Because um, first and foremost, skill development is only one element of what makes something competitive, right? Even with tons and tons and tons of skill training, if Julius can't get access to the tools that he needs, or if he can't get timber, right? There, there's, there's a logging ban going on in Kenya right now, so, so there's timber shortages or, or very increased prices. If he can't get timber, um, then, then he can't be competitive with someone else that makes a table and, and ships it in from overseas. Uh, the, the second one is, depending on the sophistication of the business or the individual, right, um, how much, you know, primary or secondary schooling did they even finish, right, more and more work I I is needed in order to upskill them to a level to be competitive, right, things such as problem solving, critical thinking, divergent thinking, uh, you know, the, the microeconomics of consumer demand versus, you know, consistency, things such as economies of scale, th these are things that maybe we often take for granted, um, as many of us have probably finished you know, advanced schooling, um, but, but an individual that has, you know, not yet even a secondary education uh, will take a lot longer um, to, to translate these concepts. And then finally, um, you know, we asked the question, how much should be done via the platform versus the individual? And, and I guess our takeaway is that uniquely within countries like Kenya or within Africa, these platforms that pop up can play a substantially larger role in development and in readiness training or in subsidizing or filling in within the gaps that um, you know, skills don't, don't actually exist. So, so we see this as a huge opportunity, for example, in our case, that we can give Julius, who is otherwise unbanked, a loan in order to buy the tools that he needs to succeed, um, we see as an opportunity that otherwise might not make as much sense in a developed market. So um, I'll stop there and I'll end it off. I think maybe I was a bit over, but thanks so much for the time and I look forward to a discussion. So, well, thanks, Adam. I think uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, thought-provoking uh, issues there that we can come back to. I'd now like to pass to Stella. Do you want to use, do you want to use this microphone or? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So, yes, I'm Stella Chonka, and I'm representing Zimba Women. Yes, we use I ICT skills in order to help small, business, uh, small businesses, especially owned by women. And this started in Uganda, and we use that to integrate them in their business services to the people that they offer them to. And also, we offer capacity building, and ICT skills to the less fortunate that are not able to access this on a normal day. Okay, so yes, for me, I would love to have an interactive session because someone could have something in mind that they want to ask. And yes, well, for some of the things that I've noticed in regards to making proper use of digital skills, whether on e-commerce platforms or just to sell, and reach out to customers. There are so many things that are lacking, especially in the African markets. Many of us, I'm sure like 90% of us here use social media, right? Yes? So take an example of social media. Some of us have been able to earn off that through uploading different pictures and everything, and someone is like, oh, hi, I'm interested in this. Can you deliver? You're like, oh, yes, 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 yes. You take it there and everything, and that's the end of the story. Now, so much could have happened in that whole link from when the person takes interest in the product up to the final delivery of the service. First of all, people do not take keen interest in, so for example, the problems that I've seen that we have faced, people do not take keen interest in, say, giving the specifications of products being offered. Someone will tell you, I'm selling this glass, they will not give you the, the length of the glass, they will not give you the radius, yet all this is important because at the end of the day, customers are very specific people and they are looking for certain things when, when they are getting certain products. So chances are by the time a product reaches you, it's either, it's chances are it's either exactly what you saw or less than what you saw, yes? Or you order for something in a different color, they deliver in a different color. 
Which brings us to the question, where are we going wrong? One, market research. Many people are coming up with businesses because of the despair to earn, but not everyone is taking initiative to see that they are giving this business the very best. Right from market research, what is your niche as, as you, as a business owner? What is your niche? Because if you sell to everyone, then you're selling to no one, okay? I want us to understand one thing that as long as you come up with a business, you better have a niche. By niche, I mean a certain classification of people that you're targeting as your target market. Get to study them. What are their likes? What, their, what are their dislikes? What new things are they adopting to as a business? What, what things can you integrate in your business to reach out to them, to simplify work for them? Breaking down the details of products or services being offered is very key to this niche market so that someone doesn't have to keep on asking, um, what did you say that product does? Where did you say I can get it from? Where are your offices? These are things that seem light, but then they get tiring for a customer. Yet there are people who actually upload pictures of, say, products and, and, and never put prices. Why? Why is that? And they keep on telling you, WhatsApp me on this number. Now, if I'm really desperate for a product and there is someone willing to offer me the price immediately, what makes you think I'm going to go all the way to save your number just to ask how much is this? Yes? Which brings me to the fact that our content writing, many of us are still lacking in our content. We put it out for the sake, either we copy and paste from the, from the internet, but we are not communicating to the target market. Or sometimes we use language that appeals to us as the people writing, but is not appealing to the target market. If you are doing things for children and you use black and white or dull colors, you're not reaching out to them because children like bright colors. Women, for example, we like sassy things, the fonts you use. If you put so many paragraphs in your content, then people are lazy to read. Sometimes people are lazy to read unless they really want to know something. So how you come up with your content and how you develop your content, it's okay to seek for help, especially if you know that you're going to send it out there because whatever goes onto the internet will never come off. So today I will see this post. 48 hours, Adam will see this post. Someone else next year will see that very same post. And if you put shady work out there, no. It's not going to make so much sense, either business sense to you, the person selling, not even to the person that you're trying to reach out. Then we look at videography and photography skills. This all comes across not only social media, but e-commerce as a whole, websites. Which kind of website do you have? How interactive is your website? When I click on the home button and I click and I find a link on your home button, can I actually be directed to exactly what I'm looking for? Many of us have so many dysfunctional websites, but we have them for the sake. Yet they are supposed to give us 24 hour presence for our brand where we are not. Even when you're home sleeping, someone can go to your website and see what you do. But in this era, many of us are just doing things for the sake of because every business has got to own a website. Invest in your business. However small it is, we always talk to the women. We, we had a FUNZI training session, FUNZI 101. It's a business training, okay? And we, we, we were able to interact with the different ladies that own these businesses. And, and, and they had real issues. They're like, okay, now for me, I have this product and it can be great. But then I, I wouldn't know how to advertise it. I wouldn't know how to market it. Later on to figure out which kind of talent to hire to do the job. Yes? There is one thing to look at someone's CV, but what are their strengths? What are their abilities as you hire them for some of these roles? Because as we further go for e-commerce, we need to get people to trust the products. We need to get people to trust our services, that they can speak for themselves without us saying anything, okay? Yes, for coders, people who do software development and coding know these things. That the moment you put up something and the button is not responsive, even if it's just a send button, a customer will never re revisit your platform 
to see what you have because the first attempt for them to try and communicate to you as a business owner, they did not succeed. Customers, we are not patient people, that's one thing I know. And at a certain point, we are all customers, yes? So we know how it would feel for you to be able to go to a website or an e-commerce platform and not be able to see what you're looking for. Yet this is what the business is known for per se. Yes, then we look at photography, videography. What quality of photos do you use on your websites, on your e-commerce platforms, on your social media to sell to people products? Do not get just any photographer. Get someone who has an, an identification with your brand. Whether we are selling food, whether we are selling a pencil or a pen or this glass, we usually pick interest in it because of what it looks like. Human beings are visual. So if, y if you're, you see, one of the best companies that has the greatest advertising ever in history, Coca-Cola, because they involve all the six emotions, the six for women, the five for men, <laughs> senses of a human being, yes? From taste to touch to feel to smell, if anything, why is that? Because they take off time to invest in their market research, in their videography and photography. I can never forget those guys' adverts. Why? Because first of all, the songs are interesting. And then they work according to the calendar events of the year. Christmas, they'll come up with something. Easter, they'll come up with something. Independence, they'll come up with something. Mother's Day, they'll come up with something. Why don't we do the same? We might not be as big as they are, but these are days that touch people's hearts. These are days that people celebrate. So for me, as, as well, as someone still who does digital marketing, there is a strategy I use for that. O you're not going to shove down products, th like down people's throats every day they see buy this, buy this, buy this, we are buying this, we are buying this. How about you come up with a strategy even when you're doing a content plan? Monday, for example, come up with something educative and informative about your brand or a similar brand. Wednesday, come up with, still, it can be a short, it can be a, a, sh a, a quote. You can celebrate the woman crush, depending on your product, any of your customers. Then Friday, something with happy vibes, something that's going to make people feel like you're not being so uptight on a Friday putting articles. Put something interesting, welcome them to the weekend. Put a sale on Friday to give them back something after they've purchased the whole week. Who wouldn't want to participate in a sale? Black Friday, guys. I mean, these are things that customers look out for whether in big portions or in small portions, just to be able to cater for the customer beyond ourselves as business owners. That alone gives us potential to grow in business because that way we get people talking. And a good word is, a, a bad word is better to sell because people are willing to spread that. But once someone gives a good word, a good recommendation for your product or service, that will go far and apart without you even having to use your marketing sometimes. Okay? Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Great. So yes, um, that was more of an introduction and let's say any questions which will come after this gentleman. I'm good for now. Thank you, Stella. Yeah, we can come back and have a bit more of the interaction. I hope that you don't. Maybe we should follow Adam's uh, lead there and get up and walk around. I think there we go. Uh, maybe if you want to get up and walk around, uh, that would be fine. We'll stay here. So uh, we'll pass to Jerry now for a word from his point of view. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, thanks for being here on a public holiday. Um, I know you went out of your way. So just a brief introduction and some context. Um, I'm from the GSMA. The GSMA, uh, acronym for GSM Association, 
is a member body. We have represented the interest of mobile operators for over 30 years now, uh, spread across uh, the globe. And I lead our mobile for development work stream in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I'll go briefly into it in a moment. But really for us at the GSMA and the work we do under M4D, Mobile for Development, is really bringing together mobile operators, uh, bringing together donors and innovators to develop and create uh, solutions, innovative solutions that have a social and economic uh, benefit. So we do have uh, a great interest in the topic of e-commerce, of, of, of the internet, um, mainly because, you know, if you think about it, there are over 5.1 billion mobile users, unique mobile users globally. Of this, 3.8 billion um, have access to the internet. And many of these are in the low and middle income countries. Now, Really, for the low and middle income countries in which you know Africa falls, mobile is really the first and only platform or medium that they have to access the internet. And that is why today we see a lot of innovations around the mobile. Um, I, I'm sure uh, you know Adam from Link and my brother here would talk a little bit more about the innovations around mobile. Uh, but for us really at, uh, at GSMA, we are supporting innovators to bring about um, better use and scale of uh, mobile innovations. Uh, because this, because mobile has greater reach, um, you know, am among the population. Um, and you really, if you look at the numbers, it's a one platform that you know, um, as we like to say, really bring some equalization in the society. Um, the GSMA is also known for its convening power. We run the largest um, telecom event, ICT event anywhere in the world. Our Mobile World Congress event in Barcelona every year at the end of February. And we run other events in the regions that brings together different stakeholders from the various um, uh, ecosystem. Um, from some of the work that we've done uh, uh, across, I mean, looking at the at internet, mobile internet, and looking at e-commerce, it's, it's been very evident that many people do not think that the internet is for them. They do not see the relevance because maybe the um, internet lacks, you know, the relevant content. Others, you know, feel they do not have the skills necessary to engage, you know, with the internet. And in truth, many of the, of the users who think of themselves as digital are actually interested only in the messaging and chatting, um, you know, opportunity. Um, which then limits what they're able to do, you know, with the use of mobile. Um, and we see this even with the, you know, with the early adopters and would-be adopters. Um, of course, the ones that are mostly affected, you know, um, are the marginalized groups. Women, for instance, many times do not find that relevance on the, on the internet. Uh, and they actually don't feel, you know, that they, you know, they have the necessary skills to actually interact with the internet. So uh, I will leave it at that in terms of uh, introduction and just context, and uh, you know, continue into the discussions. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jerry. So, uh, last but not least, in our four, I'm still hoping that we'll have a couple of seats, uh, you know, filled by the end. You know, I never give up hope. But if somebody feels inspired, there are two very comfy seats, and so I can assure you they're probably even more comfy than the ones you're sat in. So, if you're feeling confident, uh, why not? Why not give it a go? Um, but last, uh, but not least, for the moment, 
is uh, Derek. So Derek, please tell us about, uh, about, about Herdy and your experience. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Happy Independence Day. We call it Jamuhuri here. Uh, 56 years ago, we gained independence. It's a good day for all of us Kenyans here. Uh, I'll start with a story. Three years ago, in 2015, I found myself at crossroads. I had just ventured into a rabbit farm. And the person who sold me on the idea told me that there is an insatiable market in China, a billion plus people. How do you feed all these people? And these people import all their food products and they're looking for new alternatives, especially for protein. And uh, the guy had gotten a contract for about four metric tons of rabbit meat a month. And he was looking for farmers to do the outgrowing scheme for him. So that was a very good opportunity for me. I jumped in uh, and I ventured into rabbit farming. Started with 30 rabbits. And the idea was how do I scale this farm? Because four metric tons is quite a bit. This guy had about 3,000 contracted farmers at the time. So being trained in IT, I was a developer. I decided to build a farm automation tool, which I called RabbitAQ at the time. And this tool helped me grow my farm. So I put in an input, say for example, I want to have 1,000 rabbits in 60 days. And the tool would just tell me how to do that. It was a business planner. And it worked so well, uh, I was using it for my own use. And about eight months later, there are about 4,000 users from across Africa, India, uh, you know, Jamaica using the platform. And I mean, those are not my target audience. But I had grown my farm from 30 rabbits to 650 in just about four and a half months. And the guy who contracted me came, took a bit of my rabbits, didn't pay me, went out, came back after three months, took a few more rabbits, didn't pay me. And I was like, man, this is, this is a losing game. Uh, and doing a little bit of research, I realized if you're in Kenya, there is this story of quail farming. So guys will sell you on an idea, you outgrow for them, they come by and you'll never see your money. And it's, it's been like this for quite a while. It's pretty much to the same story you hear about the monkey it's in the village. So this guy will come, tell you guys, hey, there's a market for monkeys. I wanna buy your monkeys. And you all go out, look for monkeys, come, come buy. He buys everything, comes back and say, hey, there are more monkeys we need. You go buy monkeys and then he sets up another business where you buy monkeys from him to sell back to another person. So it's kind of like the same uh, circular business. So I got really pissed and a lot of people would just give up. And uh, being the person I am, I don't give up easily. I started selling rabbits on Facebook. And I'm sure none of you I have a looking for rabbits on Facebook for dinner, right? So yeah, that was my story. So I reached out to a few restaurants, like the Carnival, and I was like, hey, you guys are selling, you know, uh, weird products, crocodile meat, I don't know what, uh, antelopes, here is something unique for you guys as well. Would you buy some rabbits? So they gave me a short-term contract for about six months, supplied a thousand rabbits, ran out on my farm, so went back and bought rabbits from other farmers. So these are all the farmers who are using my platform on RabbitAQ. So it was a very complex system using QR codes and a lot of machine learning. And it was very difficult because the farmers at the time didn't have smartphones, they didn't understand QR codes. And their core challenge was how do we move our products because we all got, we all got uh, conned. So how do we get to market? So we transformed our tool from a hard management solution into a marketplace where you sell livestock products, hence the name Hadi. So, because the tool was called Rabbit IQ at the time, and farmers reached out to us and like, hey, would you build chicken IQ? Would you build fish IQ? And like, too many IQs here, so let's build an integrated solution. So this tool was basically a one-page website. Clients would come, click, and buy a box of rabbit meat. So it was three kilos at the time, about $18, that's about 1,800 shillings, and we deliver the rabbit meat to you in 72 hours. And uh, a lot of our customers were early adopters. So they've bought from Amazon, from eBay. So very conversant with e-commerce. E uh, I was not. So we were just building a tool to sell rabbit meat. But clients would come back to us and ask us, hey, we want chicken, we want fish, we want octopus, we want vegetables, we want fruits. Like, we're just selling rabbit, just buy the product, you know, uh, and move on. But people are not content. For you to grow your business, you have to take on a lot of feedback. So at the time, I was just by myself, and I had a lot of challenges just in the operational beat because e-commerce is not just about selling a product online. Uh, as I'll use Adam's line, actually, uh, 
James line. Uh, yesterday he was telling me, you know, e-commerce is like selling a bottle of water or a bottle of wine. So it's the same product, but in a new bottle. So how do you sell the same product, but in a different way? And to understand e-commerce, you have to understand the old wine. You have to understand retail. How does retail work? So I had to vast myself with a lot of things which I had not prepared for. I had to learn logistics. I had to learn warehousing. I had to learn data analysis. Who are my clients? Where are they? And people are not content on the internet. We used to deliver in 72 hours and we sell food products. And you can imagine, people want immediate gratification. This is food. I'm not gonna wait. I'm not buying a handbag. I'm not, I'm not gonna wait for two weeks for you to deliver my dinner, you know? I'll just walk to the shop and buy. So what are people are looking for online are convenience, price differentiation. Uh, they're looking for a wide assortment of products. People don't want to run around looking for things. They just want to have everything delivered to them very conveniently, well packaged. Tell me what I'm buying outright. And when I think of e-commerce, I'd like to think about Tinder, the dating app. Uh, and it's, it's very idealist in the sense that you're looking at this beautiful woman and you set up a date and when she comes, very big fact of how people, you know, take up on e-commerce. So, and specifically in Kenya and in Africa, I've seen understanding the local context is very important. In Kenya, you have this thing we call my guy. So if you look at someone's phone, for example, they have a list of contacts who do everything for them. And understanding that context online, especially here, then puts you on a very different category to any other e-commerce platform. So when, for example, Jumia comes into the market, how do you compete differently with them? Understanding the local context. So those are the small nuances. Actually, they're not small, they're huge. That we had to you know, try and understand and learn. So, I mean, for us, Digital skills in e-commerce, when we speak of digital, what do we mean? It's not just posting a product on social media. Uh, a lot of big companies like Juma, for example, have a billion dollars in marketing money. If, if you're an SME, you don't have any money for marketing, you know? But you have to understand that because you don't have money to put up a physical location, your marketing is your location, 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 location. The prime real estate in this day and age is the mobile phone. So I'm not going to put up a million dollars to buy a prime location in a supermarket. I'd spend a million dollars to build the best service on the smartphone. And how do I get across to a million customers with the least amount of money? So for us, we don't have money to hire a digital agency to do marketing for us. We had to learn how do we spend money on buying media ads on Facebook, on Google, on Instagram, on Twitter, and all these different media platforms. Because when you hire, it's all about cutting the middleman. And in, in e-commerce, a digital agency is basically a middleman. 40% of your marketing money is marketing fees for the digital agency. And you want every kick of the buck to go into your marketing. So for us, or for any entrepreneur who's looking to do e-commerce, in this day and age, they're very uh, different skills that you have to learn and acquire. So search engine optimization, for example. Today, if you search fresh meat delivery in Nairobi, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, probably number six, it's going to be hardy. So how do you learn SEO? How do you use the skills to reach the market? How do you do content marketing to influence your audience? How do you use data analytics? How do you track your user's behavior? Where do they shop? What are they looking for? How do you use all these skills to basically provide more value and deliver more value to your customer? And hopefully these are the questions we like to tackle and uh, talk about. And I look forward to a very interesting conversation with all of you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, well, that's...
covers our little talk. Nobody brave enough. I thought we'd got an extra speaker there for a moment. I thought that was so. Um, but we can open up. Would you? Would you? Would you like to come? And is this another volunteer to come? What's the question? Hello, sir. Uh, can I you stay introduce there. yourself? Je reste ici ou? Would I stay here? Do you have a speech or? Okay, I have a speech and also a question. Should I start? You can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Joveth Kensela. I am a digital consultant in Tananarivo, Madagascar. I am very happy to see and to listen to the speech by Mr. Jerry from GSMA because GSMA has now looked at use, usage of networks and they are looking at competencies for digital um, capacity building. And I believe that one of the major challenges in digital usage is also the use of the infrastructure. This means that the communication that has been done to date has been to say that we do not have enough infrastructure, but we should actually be helping with the infrastructure that we have in place. But we are convinced that this cannot work unless there is harmonious development within the competitiveness and building of confidence towards digitalization and e-commerce. The consequence of this is that in Madagascar, which is, of course, on the continent, e-commerce is very important for the local market because uh, we are very far from other countries, and therefore for us it is important to use e-commerce for trade and also locally. It's also to use e-commerce for international trade because we do not have a lot of relationships with other countries for us. It is very important what is going on today because because of the infrastructure vision, we have a lot of problems in structuring the local dynamic, the trade, and also there is a question of digitalization and payment because this costs a lot. The infrastructure using telecommunication is expensive and even worse, I can share, and there is a colleague here who can also talk of the same, the competencies that could help us to develop local trade has been taken up by foreign um, organizations. There is the EU and the enterprises that are coming to Madagascar who have more competitiveness than us. They are more competitive than the local market, and this places them at an, at an advantage. So what I'd like to know, so can we see how we can work with this so that we can reinforce the competent, compet, competence within the country so that there is also local e-commerce and this can reinforce the local market and also need, meet the needs at national and international level? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I didn't catch your name at the beginning, but speaker from Madagascar, whose question essentially was addressed at Jerry, but turned around the issues of infrastructure and how to build local infrastructure connection, knowing that the access was not very high in Madagascar and that it was expensive and so on. And the question was how to create the dynamism in the local economy uh, so that e-commerce can take off. So, Jerry. Can you hear me on this? Can you hear? No? Yeah? You can hear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I didn't get the first part of the question, but thanks, James, for the abridged uh, version. Um, and please stop me if um, what I've captured is not correct. You've talked about the infrastructure. And today, mobile, as I said, is really the infrastructure that the bulk of the population is relying on to be able to carry out ICT services um, and ICT you know, solutions. Um, and in this case, as you, know, you have noted, you know, even, even e-commerce. Um, so initially, um, 
what the, and as I said, we represent the interest of the mobile operators. The mobile operators were always seen as a plat as a pipe through which many other organizations, you know, would be able to plug into and provide services. But really, as, as you think about it now, the mobile operators are getting to a place where they are saying, we are no longer just a pipe. We want to play in the various spaces um, that are available uh, digitally in a more inclusive manner, which means operators are looking for partnerships. Operators are looking for collaboration. Um, if, I, if I give the example of, uh, you know, Hardy or Link, uh, who are represented here, and the likes of, you know, Jumia also, what really is happening is these mobile operators are very keen to work with innovators because they understand that they may not be in a place to develop all the solutions that are necessary. But they are happy to work with innovators that will leverage on their, plat on their platforms in order to provide services. A lot of times what you see as a challenge for mobile operators, um, and I think what you are talking about, you know, the issue of in infrastructure, and I, I, have a, I have an idea of, uh, of the market in Madagascar having supported one of the operators there. Um, I know that rural access, for instance, is a massive challenge. Providing that infrastructure in the rural area, connectivity, is a massive challenge. So what are we doing, you know, as an industry, or even as GSMA? So one of the things we are doing now is providing uh, grants um, to innovators that are looking to provide infrastructure or support mobile operators provide infrastructure in the rural area at a low cost. So we are actually in the process of piloting some of these solutions, uh, which if, if proven, and we are very confident that it will be, um, and it will be sustainable, then operators would be able to embrace and you know, provide the, you know, roll out the infrastructure um, in the rural market. Allow me to also say that in the case of Madagascar, how we are also seeing that space developing is I'm actually aware of an entrepreneur in Madagascar who's currently working with Amazon to provide a call center in Madagascar, the first of its kind you know, in the region. Okay? So you can already see this idea of you know, partnership and collaboration with local entrepreneurs, which would hopefully be able to grow, you know, um, that you know e-commerce sector because the people that would work in, that, in those call centers, the skills that will be developed, will be for the local people. But having said that, it's not just about the mobile operators. It's not just about the innovators. You know, the policymakers have a role to play. What sort of environment are they providing? to ensure that, yes, the infrastructure is there in the rural area, but even then, there is an enabling environment, even for the innovators, for mobile operators, to provide these services at a you know, competitive rate. So I don't know whether I've answered your question, but I'm happy to take some more. Thank you, Jerry, for a response to, to Madagascar. I'll just hold off. I know we've started with questions, and I'm, I want to I wanna get there, but we've had a a brave participant from the audience who stepped forward, you, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're open to others, so if you feel the inspiration, um, pass, let me have a signal. Um, but, you know, maybe um, before we come back to this question, and I think I'll hold something there from Madagascar, because there was the issue about infrastructure, but I think behind it was also this dynamism. And I think as Jerry has begun to, to, to mention, there's more in the dynamism than just bigger pipelines for digital uh, uh, digital connections, uh, there's more to that. And so uh, we've had a, a very interesting interventions that we can come back to about the kind of skills at the entrepreneurial level. And I think there's been some very practical uh, indications there. But towards 
we should slowly move to what we want as recommendations out of this. What can we do with this? I mean, this is the big challenge for us, and to recommend to UNCTAD and through UNCTAD uh, what, our, what our findings have been. But first, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Bryce to the panel, who's going to say a few words about his experience in Kenya. So, Bryce, thanks. I was hoping that a brave uh, a lady would join us, but a brave man is also good. <laughs> so thank you, James. Uh, my name is Bryce Loving. I run an online to offline marketing advisory practice called Loving Brands International. Um, I'm also a global shaper, which is an initiative of the World Economic Forum. Um, and I've been based here in Kenya for two years. My background's in consumer goods and retail strategy. Uh, so I spent um, several years working with Walmart US buyers, helping them craft their, their strategies when it's in pharmaceutical categories and then also in their bakery categories too. Um, obviously the world's largest retailer and it's a large brick and mortar retailer, but at the same time they've been combating to figure out how do they also go, uh, go forward in e-commerce as well, right? Because they should need to be a strategy that works in tandem. Um, I would say one of the things that Stella said that really, that really struck me earlier is kind of the, the lack of skills gap within our SMEs. Um, and more specifically, over the past uh, few months, I've had a lot of meetings with large retailers here in Kenya, um, and then also airlines too here locally. And what we noticed there too is that they, they've always had their go-to-market strategy be really focused on their traditional strategy, so whether it's billboards, TV commercials, newspaper ads, um, but at the end of the day, those, on, those marketing strategies aren't really delivering um, the online result or their, their normal performance that you would expect from those kind of companies, right? A retailer should be more adept into figuring out how do they go to market. And these are big brick and mortar stores. And the reason why it's a really critical issue is because if these brick and mortar retailers or airlines don't get it together on figuring out how do they go market, they're going to end up closing stores. People are going to lose their jobs. And so especially when you're looking at the medium-sized enterprises, if they're not able to, to connect with, with users in the way that they haven't in the past, um, and it's different from strategy versus execution. So everyone does digital execution. I mean, if you, there's a 15-year-old somewhere in the company that can post things on Facebook, that's probably the same level that they're achieving and the same level of performance. But they need to figure out what is that strategy that's actually going to drive those, those offline results. Because you can't deposit reach into the bank. So you can have a million people that saw your ad, but if no one is actually making a purchase from that and it's not driving your business performance, it's really critical. Um, and there'll be, closed, there'll be store closings, you'll have to close routes out if it's an airline. So it's really important to figure out how do you connect the online to drive your offline performance. So that's kind of why, and it comes down to content. So even if you think about um, the content and the ad copies, when she said like Coke, Coke is probably one of like Coke and Safaricom are the only ones locally that I think do digital marketing really well. Obviously they have really big marketing budgets and really big spend budgets um, and they have a lot of international expertise in markets that are way more developed and that's how they're able to execute um, these campaigns and actually drive the sales performance with it. Um, but what's really scary is that there's middle-sized companies, middle-sized retailers that don't have that expertise and they're just posting things online and it comes down to um, even like Adam saying, if you're just posting things online, how are you, like, what's the imagery look like? Because the content is king, right? So you need to make sure that that imagery holds up to what Safaricom would post or what Coca-Cola would post. Um, and if it doesn't, it's going to look subpar. And I think that's kind of why we talk about that race to the bottom. It just looks like it's a race to the bottom because the content's not good or there are misspellings in the, in the ad copies and typos. And so those things discount the brand heavily. And, and if you know that that's something, and I can, it, I can implore all the, all the entrepreneurs out there, if you realize that you're, you're offline or your online results are not actually driving anything, you probably are lacking that strategy overall, right? You have the execution, you know how to post things, but if it's not driving any performance, then that's the strategy you need and you need to figure out who around you or what professionals can you talk to that can give you that, that strategy consulting perspective of saying this is how we're going to connect all of the online results and online reach and the campaign efficacy. What's the ROI look like? Because if you're just spending money online and it's not driving your performance, you could just be throwing that money out on the street or donating it, right? So figure out what you're doing to drive that content and figuring out, um, even if you have a photographer, is the photographer getting the right shots? And that's a big gap, skill gap in the market is photography. Everyone, a lot of people have smartphones and can take pictures even within your internal teams or your marketing teams, but if they're actually not taking good shots um, and it's not, not getting the kind of resonance that you think it should, then there's probably something wrong with the imagery or the ad copy that's, not miss or that's missing the customer and not reaching that connection. 
Um, so when Stella was bringing up all those, all those gaps, they're definitely something that we see with small businesses, right? Because small businesses, how would you, as a manufacturer or somebody who's originating a service, how would you have that expertise in-house? So then if you start looking at the medium-sized companies, they have people that are posting, but it's not necessarily driving the results. So figure out what exactly is your execution, right? If, is there an execution problem? But there, there may be a niche problem too. So coming from a consumer goods standpoint, when you're building a brand, how is this product niched out in the market that's gonna serve something that's not existing in the market today? That niche is really critical because if, there's, if you're going after a market that, doesn't have, that, that isn't needed, then you'll end up, you'll end up gone. So, thanks. Okay, Bryce, uh, thank you for that. Uh, now I'd like to hand over to another special guest who's presented themselves from the audience. Copia uh, Thierry, yes, qui nous rejoint. You're from Burkina Faso. You're going to speak in French, I believe. Yes, I'm speaking in French. You're representing an com e-commerce company. Yes, the e-commerce sector in Burkina Faso. Perhaps you could give an overview of the situation of e-commerce in Burkina Faso and the skills that are required. And do you have an opinion on what the government should be doing and which associations are there amongst the companies? I'm from Burkina Faso. I have a company for developing computer solutions and also a platform for online shopping. Um, the president of an association for e-commerce in Burkina Faso, and I'm here to share my experience with you. The state of e-commerce in Burkina Faso is not yet at the critical level. Since last year, the government began to mobilize. They began to understand that e-commerce is a factor where they should put effort and we have assisted at workshops, training sessions, and even the week of e-commerce, where startups were invited, local companies, and with along with youth, the explosion of the digital world, mobile telephones, a large number of people, young people, are migrating towards e-commerce because this is the market of the future. And it's been understood in Burkina Faso, but this comes with its own difficulties in our country because already there's the problem of trust. As e-commerce merchants, we require trust from our clients. They give you money before they receive their goods. And so therefore, even that is a problem. There is no trust yet in e-commerce. We have to bring the people to trust in what we're doing, to be able to have faith in us that e-commerce is the market of the future. And we have so many difficulties with the current way of marketing, whereas e-commerce doesn't require much capital to start up. And our main comments these days are to persuade all to have trust, connectivity as well. We're on 3G, that's also an issue. We are seeking to work so that trust is established. And within our association, we are seeking to create within Burkina Faso, a certification scheme for those who are working in e-commerce. And it would be that certificate provided to small companies which will provide the trust. Let me take an example. Someone goes to a platform to buy, they will see the certification relating to our association from the Ministry of Development, etc., and the Ministry for Trade, Ministry for Trade, and that will create the involvement of the government in e-commerce in Burkina Faso and allow people to have more trust on that platform because of that certificate. So that will increase confidence by the user. And beyond that, we're also working on other matters in Burkina Faso during the e-commerce week. We were implementing this idea so that it 
can be made aware to all citizens in Africa so that this initiative can provide more trust to users, to clients who are going to use our platforms. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for coming up um, forward and um, expressing this problem of confidence, as you call it, or trust to be the case. It's a, it's a fact that we'll come back to. Um, I'd particularly like to encourage some, uh, some questions to women in the audience. We're slightly underrepresented on the panel. Is there any, uh, uh, are there any uh, questions here in particular? And I will favor an intervention in this sense. Is anybody, if anybody feels that they want to come up and speak and have that opportunity, seeing as I've already offered it to two speakers, you can signal now. You want, you want to come up or you want to speak from the floor? You can speak from there, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Lino. I'm from uh, Kigali and I have a digital marketing agency. So most of the time I work with uh, e-commerce businesses. So I would like just to talk about uh, the uh, skills gap. So actually uh, we see that now is uh, people want to start to sell online. And also some businesses are already online. But uh, when you're talking about skills, uh, the gap skills, actually what I always uh, advise to them, it is just to, to see what is uh, going well with their strategy. Actually, we do uh, like a channel performance tracker, or we track the performance of each uh, channel they use. And then we see, if you see that Facebook is good for you, just try to master uh, Facebook. Because actually, now there are many skills. Digital skills are many. If you try to pick all of them, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard for you. Because actually, you, you, you find also the staff, they don't have many staff, many people uh, who can do that. So what I, uh, I always suggest or is just to master the channel that work well with the, the audience and the niche, actually. Because now, uh, um, here, let me just give you an example. Uh, we were just running an, a, a campaign to uh, specifically to uh, Goma and Bukavu. We were selling something there. So what we have been able to see, it is just uh, only 30% of women uh, engage with uh, our, our ads uh, versus 70%. Uh, so which means uh, we get an idea from that because that Goma and Bukavu, uh, few women, few women comparing to women, uh, to, comparing to men, use uh, mobile and they use uh, Facebook actually because we were running an ad on Facebook. So the skills, having the skills of uh, trying to, or to analyze data, to drive uh, a meaningful insight and take actionable action which going with uh, your, uh, your, your audience and uh, your uh, your, your ads, actually is, this is what they need to do. So what I'm going to emphasize, there are many businesses, but try to see what's work well. Like uh, there are now channels that can work well in Africa, like uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp business. Now there is WhatsApp business that can work very well. If you, a business can master that, uh, it can really, really work well with uh, your strategy if you want to make more sale. And, uh, so this is uh, actually what I would like to say about uh, the skills gap. Try to see in your organization what you need actually, yeah. And also uh, like uh, mobile will be a trend. It is now uh, a trend already. And also video. They say about uh, content. Huh? So because actually what I see in uh, market, digital marketing is a, is a mix of uh, uh, art and uh, science actually, right? So you have to mix all, the, all them. So we need content which can engage, engage our audience. Huh? Mm -hmm. So in our, every organization or business, they have to see what's really work well and they stick with that. Don't pick everything. Because you see a, a, a small business is on every uh, platform. Yeah, you can see on, on Twitter, on WhatsApp, on uh, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn, everywhere. But you have to see 
which we work well and then stick with that stay with that and try to right. to master that yeah okay. thank you so, so thank you so the comment is about understanding channels and working out what's best for you and are there any opportunities in africa a microphone microphone please for the speaker great i think we all want to get up and stretch mm -hmm. That's Hi there, I'm Sinead Johnson. Um, the previous gentleman just spoke about generating insights, right, on the digital economy, micro-workers and SMEs. Well, I'm from an organization called Senfree in Cape Town. We have a research think tank facility called Insight to Impact. And two weeks ago, we published some re research on the platform economy in Africa for at least eight countries, including Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa. We've, so there a couple of things have been said over the past few days. Um, a couple of things have been said around sort of Western platforms taking over African space. We've identified maybe 280 digital platforms that are operational across eight countries. 80% of those platforms originate from Africa. That's something we didn't know before and it was quite surprising. Um, what that means is that these local platforms um, like Link and others that originate here, they're really able to identify what the core um, digital skills requirements are for the individuals and merchants who are participating on these platforms. We don't, didn't only look at the number of platforms that are operational, we also looked into the, the, the number of micro-workers that are essentially participating. So Research ICT Africa conducts an after-access survey. We found almost five million platform workers are actually using the digital economy as a way to generate income. A lot of them are operational in the online shopping space, in the e a lot of the e-commerce sectors like e-hailing, um, but also freelance sectors um, which relate to some of the work that Link is doing, right? We found that across, um, across these five million workers, there was an even split between female and male participants, but things like smart, smartphone penetration are, uh, it's a more serious uh, precondition for women to essentially participate on a digital platform and earn money. Um, things like financial inclusion. So women don't, you know, women, women traditionally don't, um, I think, have ownership or are able to operate their own banking accounts. So the traditional formal, um, you know, banking products or financial services that they need to run their businesses, they're not able to do that um, quite efficiently. And so we, you know, there are other mechanisms such as cash and digital wallets that have come in to kind of bridge this gap between formality and informality in financial service requirements. The other part about that, and we had a breakfast this morning, morning that was hosted by the World Economic Forum, is the divide, I think, between analog and digital. So many workers right, require digital skills to participate, but some of them and some of the merchants still expect or um, prefer to have a sort of human element in that. So we find that in many markets, intermediaries are essentially fulfilling this function of helping enterprises build their business profiles online, be that on social media platforms um, or multi-sided matching platforms. And that connection between analog and digital is probably around to stay for a long time. So not only micro-workers, but also enterprises, they'll be able to straddle the formal and informal economies, but also the analog and digital divide. I think these, th these matters are increasingly important. I have a few questions for Adam from Link. <laughs> We've been looking at some research um, from JC, J, um, JP Morgan Chase Institute. They essentially looked at, um, I think, millions or millions of accounts um, retail financial accounts um, that they have under their portfolio. And they looked at um, essentially the proportion of accounts that were generating or receiving some sort of income from platform work. It was about 1% accounts, roughly. Um, in Africa, we found that it's around 1% to 3% for the African countries we looked at. But what they observed in the US was a definite race to the bottom in terms of income generation through platforms. One, Adam, I would be really interested to spend some time looking at the data that you have um, on income streams. But two, since many of the, um, I think the professional work activities are being split up now into sort of task level activities um, with a large number of bidders, essentially bidding um, for, for these work activities, what are your thoughts around um, what will happen in the case of Africa when in the US we've seen a definite decline in income being generated um, on average? 
Sure. Um, thanks for the question. Nice to meet you. <laughs> thanks for speaking. Um, look, I, I, I think ultimately it's a choice. Um, in the United States, there is a very clear minimum wage law. There's even minimum wages per industries. So if a person chooses to drive for Uber, right, um, you can say, well, the minimum wage law in a given state is X, and this person is driving this many hours and has this level of utilization or productivity, and therefore maybe they're earning less than that. Um, again, in, in a market like Kenya, yes, there are some minimum wage laws, uh, but most of them are just not adhered to. So ultimately, it's just much, much, much less advanced than a market like the United States. So, so I'll use a very specific example. On our platform, one of our categories that we do matching in is, is full-time housekeepers or nannies. Kenya has a minimum wage law that a housekeeper or nanny is to earn, uh, well, depending on whether it's in an urban city or it's in a rural area, but in an urban city, about $110 a month. Okay. Um, however, our research shows that in the status quo, the average amount that a housekeeper or a nanny would earn is between $60 and $80 a month, right? On our platform, we just won't match nannies, one, for less than minimum wage, but also even above minimum wage. So in the case of our platform, when we do, we, we have recently done qu quite a bit of impact research, and on average, workers that join the link platform, their monthly income doubles. Now, this is not to say that platforms will always double the income of every worker that joins them, um, but, but I think the nature of things like productivity or utilization, especially when you're talking about sectors where a plumber might only have work or income two or three days of the week, and then all of a sudden you're giving them income or, or work or job opportunities five, six, seven days of the week, um, th th their income goes substantially up. In terms of amount of income that they're earning per hour or per engagement, sometimes this goes down. Like um, Uber came to the Kenyan market, and, and hands down, the, the, the taxi industry in Kenya, in terms of its market share, more than tripled, right? Like, like there's more money spent on taxis now. However, the amount of money that a taxi driver might make taking someone from, you know, Jake, uh, the airport here to town probably is less, right? Because in the past, you know, there is not this kind of like price setting or floor. Uh, however, the amount of rides or drives that a, a taxi does now um, is substantially higher. So I guess uh, that's some of the experiences that we found, right? We set our own minimum wages that we won't match jobs for, for less than because in cases where we don't see existing policy, we have to make our own. Um, we set them at what we call the equilibrium between customer demand, right? Because customers maybe won't pay more than X amount for, we don't do taxis, but like won't pay more than X amount for a taxi ride from the airport to town. Um, but the equilibrium between customer demand and um, like worker productivity, right? So a scenario in which we're giving enough income to a worker to, or enough jobs to a worker to make them heavily utilized that they earn usually double their income. So like in many categories, we have uh, minimum income guarantees actually. Um, that, that's how we choose to solve it at Link. Again, um, I, I think the race to the bottom is something that platforms must always be cognizant of. But again, in scenario, like, like in the United States, the average, I think the, the unemployment rate is between three and 4% now, right? Um, whereas in Kenya, I mean, it is, is maybe as high as, no one really knows, but maybe as high as 30 to 40%. Okay, so um, like I think maybe the, the, the first step should be thinking about how to reliably solve that, and then the next step should be about how to set regulations and stuff. And again, if platforms can do it from the beginning, they, like, like we had the opportunity to, I think that's great. But um, first, try to give people consistent work and then increase the value of that work. I hope okay. that answers the question. Okay, so let me, just before we, we pass on to more questions, thanks for the intervention. Is okay. there anything you want to respond to? Yeah, just oh. thanks, thanks for that response. Um, and then you can find myself or my colleague, um, Harriman Smith, throughout the course of the day, um, if you'd like to just learn more about some of these insights. Okay, so thanks very much. Just a little recap before we carry on. Um, we, a, t a quick time check, we're after midday. We're after midday. I don't think necessarily that we, we need to stick to the one o'clock deadline, meaning you know we can finish earlier, but I mean, I want to come back to your question, but I just want to, at this point, have a little recap. So in our initial speakers, I think we've made a journey from the specific learnings of informal sector workers, a little bit that we've come back on right now about the skills there. Um, 
but it's also important, you know, Stella reminded us about some of the competencies that you need to have to get into this business. And we've been reminded by a couple of, of uh, questions so far about understanding channels and understanding promotion. So there's the competency of businesses themselves. We heard a little bit here um, uh, on, the, on the end uh, um, from Derek about his very interesting journey and what he had to learn, mm. you know, as an entrepreneur to be successful in this business. So these are the kind of lessons that, uh, that we're giving you. Perhaps um, and Jerry is talking about, you know, the, the, the opportunities in mobile and the infrastructure and partners. But there's this question that th I think that we need to come out of, which is what is the proper role for governments in this, if there mm. is any? Because we heard about back to Adam about the role that marketplaces can give in terms of getting involved in the education and actually even going further than that mm. about machinery and bringing in primary opportunities. Question from Madagascar about how to create dynamism in these sectors. I think that that's more than just the digital pipeline or even the skills. There's a lot of things happening here. And then there's this question about confiance, confidence or trust, which is a big beast because that's educating the population. Yeah. It's more than digital certificates. It's about the business behaviors that Stella talked about. And business behaviors is more than digital. It's a whole bunch of things that need to be learned. So the issue that we see is that e-commerce brings out, I think as we were reminded about you know, old wine in new bottles, is to remind us that a lot of those problems that, that we've had about formalism, structure, about management disciplines, now become urgent as Africa enters into its digital revolution. With all that that supposes, those problems now become urgent to address, and how do we do it? So my question is, what proper role for government what proper role for plat platforms? How can government or a guy like me from an international organization, how shall I work with platforms? Mm. Should platforms be my partner? Can they do that? Are they fair? Are they only out to make money? And is that their right role? And indeed, this question of race to bottom that we've talked about. So with that, a little bit of an interlude. And now I'll hear some questions for you. But slowly, I want us to think about some conclusions. The areas of getting trust. I want to hear about women and gender in this, which is an important thing, about getting women online trust. And, the, and related to trust, there's this area of payments as well. I've been asked to talk to you about, about access, about understanding payments, and perhaps other things. So if there are questions which can address this, those are particularly welcome. Now, there's a bit of enthusiasm for questions here. So do we? can I see some hands? I think I am going to pick women first. Sorry, that's a bias. I'll go over here, so if we can have a mic. And I know there's a couple of questions here. I'll come back to you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Président, je suis Madame Zango. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Zango, the Director of E-commerce Promotion in Burkina Faso. Comme la plupart des like many of the speakers who have spoken, we recognize that competition in the question of ICT is a necessity for e-commerce. And this is one of the main issues that the project E-Trade for All is interested in, in terms of evaluation for the preparation of LDCs, that is the least developed countries, in e-commerce. So for Burkina Faso, we must say that the e-commerce management was created in 2013, and the role is to contribute the improvement of regulation of e-commerce and to promote e-commerce in the country. And in promotion of e-commerce, the management has organized several information and sensitization of, um, activities on e-commerce, the risks associated, as well as the measures to deal with the risk, and also on e-payments. During our information and sensitization for private sectors, administration, and as well as um, consumer information, e-commerce has often been associated with the ICT promoters, especially the B2B to C promotion, 
which allows more interest in e-commerce in the private sector and all the actors who are often re reluctant to take part in this kind of commerce. The, la the uh, level of uh, education, especially in the SMEs, SMEs in Burkina Faso, is also of concern because uh, there is the sites that already exist to balance the offer and the demand for B to B to C that call for the private sector to take the opportunity to promote uh, their produ products online and to sell them online. But the main challenge is the respect of the quality that needs to be um, upheld in the products. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are the importance of the coalitions between associations and the need to generalize the understanding and awareness for the opportunities of e-commerce. Mm. So, there were some questions over here. I can come back. I think here the gentleman there has had his hand up a few couple of times, if you could. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abia David. Okay. He's arriving. We have problems. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> speak a little bit closer to the microphone. Yeah, I'm so. saying my name is Abia David. I'm from Burundi and uh, uh, I'm a digital entrepreneur uh, and I also deal with, uh, with a lot of stuff on, uh, on empowering young people also to unleash their full potential in digital entrepreneurship. Uh, my question will be very uh, specific to fostering skills for digital, uh, uh, digital economy in Africa because uh, given the topic, I think uh, we, we should look at it more from the perspective of how do we develop the skills and my question will be uh, to the panel, to the entire panel, because at the end of the day, we want to see how do we develop these uh, skills. Because I believe, uh, like for our country, for example, uh, Burundi and some other countries that are less connected, we've been for a very long time marginalized, if I may use that word. Because uh, I, I, I'm working with an organization called the Save African Youth Campaign, and what we're trying to do in Burundi is to train more people to understand uh, digital skills and how they can use uh, uh, the digital platforms to create employment because that is an entrepreneurship. But then we've tried to contact some companies like Google through their, their program, Digital Skills for Africa, and they are telling us Burundi is not in the list. My question is, is our less connection or us being less connected to the internet a reason for us to be marginalized in developing skills for uh, for, for in developing digital skills is Burundi marginalized in in digital uh, digital literature program literacy programs or something I think that will be what I will try to address and, okay so yeah. thank you for the question and thank you for addressing questions to the panel which is a good use of their time I'm sure that you know we should use their time while they're here so the question about uh, you know skills Burundi, as you say, being perhaps marginalized in terms of its connections, you know, and availability of its connectivity. The question I propose to reinforce that is a little bit, what are the appropriate skills? You know, is it, well, you mentioned Google, is it importing knowledge from Google? Do the lessons of Google apply? Or is there something uniquely African that we have to help? Countries like Burundi, what are the lessons? Perhaps we can come back to our panelists who've been present. Would, would any of you like to take that forward? Yeah, I guess I will. Stella. Okay, um, hello, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, so thank you so much for your submission, and it's quite unfortunate that that's pointed out to your front that, okay, now you're not included in the list. However, what does that give you? It gives you an opportunity to be able to step up. It's a process of getting the recognition. I could be here speaking, but perhaps Uganda is also not on that list. I don't know that. However, what does that do for you as a person and a person that knows about that? Now, the fact that we have these resources on the internet gives us an opportunity to be able to get included somehow. You have to fight to get there. Apart from the fact that, yes, you're not included, what can you do? Do a lot of research. And why, when you're able to teach the other people that have no idea about this, start from the basics. Probably from how to switch on a computer to parts of the computer because these are the major skills someone is not going to learn how to type or how to post on Facebook minus knowing what, which materials to use, which resources to use. So make good use of the internet. 
a lot of resources are right there for your exposure. So you do not have to feel about the fact that you are not on that list because maybe a year or two from now, if you're able to do something about it, you as a representative who is standing right here can get another group of people. First, you don't even need money because you just need the space and invite the people to come over. For anyone who is on social media, at least they can get that message to send a friend who can send a friend to invite them for these engagements because in Uganda, that's what I see happening. For example, we have spaces like Hive Collab where such events happen. We have the Innovation Village where I sit. We have all these interventions that come in and happen where different people that are great in these areas come together to come and teach us, to come and mentor us in these areas. At first, we didn't know some of these things, but now, slow but sure, we are getting there. Say, for example, Zimba women, we have Zimba mat. It's a mat, it's an, it's an, e it's a, an e commerce platform where different women in business are, are now coming together and putting their products and services out there. But we have to teach them from the basics, which we did early this year. So now they are confident enough to represent their brands on general scale out there for both local and international markets. So you know what to do. You're attending these things so that you can take this knowledge back home. And one day, who knows, you'll be on that list and many other lists. Yeah. Uh, can I just attempt um, to respond to that? Um, one of the questions, you know, I would ask in response is, what is your government doing in terms of enhancing enhancing digital skills. So for instance, are they making a prior it a priority mm. um, in their school curricula, whether it's formal or informal? Mm. For that, you do not need an external party. Number two, which is something that we are encouraging um, uh, the governments to do, and I have an example from Uganda where the private sector is working with the public sector, is to ensure that the digital agenda is ingrained in the national development plans. So it becomes very central to the various sectors that the government have identified as critical in the national development plans. When they do that, there is high likelihood that resources would actually be put into the digital space. But th thirdly also, I mean, you look at you know, the likes of Hardy here, uh, Link, Eneza, you know, all these platforms. These are local uh, innovators. The beauty about these local innovators is they bring in locally uh, relevant content and, and solutions. So yes, you may have somebody from out, but they will need to understand uh, the market first. But Hardy knows Kenya. He knows what the requirements are. Link has spent a, a extensive time here. He knows what the, the laborers, the informal sector wants, and therefore they're able to develop solutions for the local market. So there are, I mean, even as my sister says, there are a number of um, you know, interventions that you can actually have locally, even before looking outside. And you'll be surprised how many you know, um, investors are available yeah. in Burundi and outside to be able to support uh, these innovations. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so for example, I'll pose uh, an example of Kenya. About 10 years ago when the president came in, well, probably shorter, he came up with this program which he called the Presidential Digital Talent Program. And the idea was how do we empower 1,000 people every year to use digital talents to create opportunities for other people. So I think this is particularly the kind of role that James is looking for. What roles can government play to create such environments for digital literacy programs? So I think that is one opportunity that you have uh, that you can pitch to your government, for example, uh, to have such programs. And I think what Stella was saying, you know, the internet democratizes data and information. So how would you utilize existing platforms, for example, Udemy, uh, lynda.com, and such, to just use content that people have created on digital literacy, digital literacy and provide that to the communities that you're trying to bring on board. So I'd say 
we don't need Google at this time, I think. Uh, we can create our own list for now. Yeah. So, I mean, let's use what's available to us right now to create the change that we are looking for. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, in answering, uh, further answering your question and linking to what uh, James was also alluding to in terms of gender. So one of the things we have done at the GSMA in su uh, to support the operators is we have developed a mobile internet skills training toolkit which operators are able to utilize uh, and adapt to their market to be able to train um, you know, uh, a number of their customers uh, on the internet. The, in, in, in Rwanda, Tigo actually focused on women uh, first. They trained agents to use the toolkit who, went, who then went on to the field and trained um, women customers. The results we saw within a few months was amazing. 15% of the customers that uh, had been trained, we actually saw a growth in their, in their data usage, mm. which actually means that now they're interacting you know, with the internet. So again, there are resources available in there mm. um, to take you a step further. So, I, James, I wanted to address one of your questions about the kind of the ICT policy recommendations for government. I think one of the things that's really important is really to have that user focus or that customer centricity whenever there's rolling out new platforms. So, I, I grew up in the South. I grew up with customer service being the number one and the priority. So, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. And it's always important to take care of your customer because that, those, those are the people that are going to be your loyal customers. And then, if you're your citizens, they're also going to vote for you, too. So, coming from a public sector perspective, um, if you're looking at how do you figure out you're rolling out new e platforms, whether it's e visas, e citizen uh, services, applying for a new passport, all that's been digitalized in Kenya. And so, if you think about how you're communicating from a design thinking standpoint of how am I communicating the steps it takes. To, to apply for a passport or to file your taxes. I think those are really important from a design thinking standpoint because you need to be able to communicate that with showing one, pictures, but also appropriate ad copies and text uh, conjoining with the content so that it, com or that it communicates a clear benefit to the citizen, but also at the same time is streamlining all the services. Because if it's not creating an, an additional convenience, it's probably creating another headache for the, for the citizen to figure out. So I think from a policy recommendation, I think it's really to, important to focus on that, that user, that citizen focus. I also like to speak. The, case, the cases of Burundi and Burkina Faso are almost similar, and I believe that the government can contribute to this. Before promoting e commerce and internet, there is need for the government to launch itself into the idea and already digitalize the government services. Once the government digitalizes its services, then it it therefore gives the population an example for them to follow. I believe it gives them confidence and also gives it a push for, towards e-commerce. E I believe it's the government that needs to start using the idea and the services online as has as, as already been said uh, getting your passports your visas online and other connectivity services everything should be done online and therefore if governments take this up then there will be a digitalization form of movement James? Um, so in, in, in contribution to what the gentleman has just said, it's beautiful to expect the government to subscribe to some of these things. However, if they do not see the need from the people, not every government is as proactive to go ahead and do it. So you as an individual, it's your role, first of all, to show the need. Come up with proposals that show that if we do not include some of these in our interventions, in, in our day-to-day -day life, then we are lagging behind in not only operations, but also in shredding, and also the country's GDP increase, you see? Because now it's up to you as a person, as an individual, to come up with a whole group, because some of us, our governments, just started this recently. But guess what? There are people who have been using this longer enough than the governments. But now when the government sees the need for this, when they see that the people are actually interested, then they will subscribe to your school of thought. 
Sometimes it doesn't start from above, unfortunately. Sometimes it starts from down. Now you as a person, it's your role to come up with different people, since you're even in a place of influence, to see how can we come together as a group. There, is, there, there are miracles in numbers, my dear. There are miracles in numbers. As long as you have a stronger stand, more than just to want to f access Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, some governments th feel threatened. So if you're able to put this to good use versus waiting for them to start using it, I think they'll come, they'll come to terms, you know, with it. It's like okay. having to convince Thanks. your parent, you know? Stella, okay. So yeah. question about, you know, reflection on individuals, feeding back to government on their responsibility, but perhaps through the intermediary of, you say, groups, associations, or whatever. So that's the intermediary level. So what the bodies of which we have, you know, an e-commerce association here, and there are and several others who are here. And in fact, the room here among peers are normally influencers mm -hmm. in making this happen. So we're individuals, but we're also members of organizations. So are there some questions? There's a question here at the back. Go ahead. And please try and speak up a little bit. We're trying to fight with the okay. King uh, Hello? Independence Day. You can hear me, Rekha. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Idris Yusuf from Nigeria. I represent Rice Silicon. So I just want to give uh, like three contributions about how we, uh, some of the things we do. And um, I, have one, I have one question from, for the man from Burkina Faso. So what we've been able to do that has helped us in e-commerce in Nigeria is actually peer-to-peer -peer training by people who are involved directly in e-commerce. And um, so I'll just quickly say we, we've been able to have various WhatsApp groups and Slack groups. Uh, with the Slack groups, we have a higher number of people. Uh, with the WhatsApp group, we have fewer number of people. And with these groups, we have modern current topics which we come together to organize fiscal trainings. And these fiscal trainings actually um, will only cost us about $8. And we have this training like three times a year, these clusters. And with these clusters, we get specific individuals, which I am one of them, to, to train ourselves. So we are the ones to learn, like the teachers. Then we get to train the clusters. Then we use the WhatsApp and the Slack groups to continue the engagement and the training. So that's just one strategy. Um, another, um, another is the issue of um, reading culture. So I have access to specific materials from the United States. So I bring in those materials physically. I'm talking about skills now, there are other areas, but the, for the skills, I bring in those books, I buy them myself, I get to read them, I share it with those that are supposed to be the people to get the knowledge. Then we get to share it electronically, and when we have the physical means, we also share fiscal. So that's about strategy. Now for the man from Burkina Faso, he said something about certification. So I'm on Conga, I'm on Jumia, I'm on GG, I'm on OLX, and I sell directly. I have a Conga certification. If e-commerce itself is decentralized, if you certify a merchant, the merchant can still sell directly. Now, if there is an item X, a merchant is selling, and you certify him to only sell specific products, if he has access to other items that are needed by other, uh, other items that are needed by buyers, you will find out that without that certification, buyers are going to go to that guy to buy him. So this decentralized nature of the internet you have to do a lot to protect the consumer and balance it with the certification of the merchants that you say you want to um, certify to sell. So without, you will find out that after like a year or two, depending on how you can enforce those laws, you will have merchants who don't have those certifications and are selling directly to the, to the buyers. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you can balance that enforcing the certification and keeping it within the space of the content. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the product. Whoever has the product that the buyers need. Either you are certified or not, 
is the product that will attract them first. So how will you actually balance that? Then on the last note, um, to protect ourselves in Nigeria, what we've been able to do, and um, my group, we try to advocate sometimes, is to do 50-50. So 50-50 is this. I sell in four marketplaces at least, and I sell directly. So our own idea is that 50% of your sales should come from the marketplace, and 50% again should come from directly from you. That actually protects you. I know the platform guys won't like that, but you know that actually protects you because um, I've been selling in the marketplace close to, in Konga now, close to five years. If a platform brings a policy that does not favor you, it's as good as your business is gone. It can happen within 24 hours. So, but you cannot also have the kind of crowd a platform has. So I encourage people to go 50-50. You do 50% marketplace, you do 50% direct. So if a marketplace says you should go due to their policy, they have the right to tell you to go. You will still have a business. But also, you know you can't have the power a platform has. So these are some of the strategies we use, apart from many, these are what is related to this session. For the other sessions, when I join, I'll share those. So these are just the little I can share for now. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So what I heard is a reminder of in e-commerce, there's commerce. Uh, so it's important you say 50-50 to actually have a, a development of a business. I mean, I think we've also noticed that it's important a lot of the basic learnings are on commerce, and you build a reputation through your products, which you can sell in a classic way. And meeting the potential buyers and having a sales record helps you. So this is what we find a lot of small businesses set out thinking that e-commerce will answer everything for them. But there, uh, there is still the traditional business to be done and to try and bring back in the reputation from that offline business to make sure that customers are willing to give testimonials mm -hmm. about how good the products are and how reliable the company is. So this touches on the big topic of trust again, and trust is a big, big beast. And different people uh, have different views on trust. I think we could have a conference just on trust and e-commerce because it can be a technical question. Some people who come in from an IT background will tell you it's about certifications and reliable and reliability of cybersecurity. Some people will tell you about legal sides and legal protection and policy. And there's also a pure business or a sociological side about educating people. And there's all the experience. In the early days, e-commerce did it begin in the early days before any of this existed. So 25 years ago or more, nobody knew what e-commerce were. There was no legislation. There was no protection. And it still took off. And this was a matter of developing, tr of developing experience and building on that. So again, we say if this is the first digital revolution that's taking back in some of those places, those, we can go faster and learn those lessons. So here was a question again, I think. From uh, I, I want to appreciate all the, the interventions about the, the, the situation in Burundi. But uh, that was a question very specific to my country, but I would like to take it also to a general level. We can look at it from the both angles. And I think uh, looking at the topic of, uh, of this session, fostering digital, uh, uh, digital fostering skills for digital economy in Africa, I believe this is one of the critical things because at the end of the day, once we want to talk about e-commerce and its success in Africa, the skills are a very critical thing. And once people are not skilled up to, to measure up into the digital economy, I think it will just be a, a uh, we'll just say was well, speak theories and then at the end of the day it will end by there. But I, but I really want to know uh, what are the concrete steps? What are the concrete steps that we, we are taking and uh, what are some of the pl programs maybe with the Africa e-commerce week? What should we expect out of this? when we talk about developing the skills uh, is there any programs are there any programs maybe organized by the by the UNCTAG I tried to approach the European Union I don't know if there's any person from the European Union in Burundi we are running programs already on dealing with that what, what they were saying about content getting content and training people uh, we've trained over 18,000 already so far since last year so uh, we, we are really trying to see how could we grow this thing because at the end of the day, yeah, I think it's Esther 
the lady just said something very important that uh, we should not expect to start from top or let's start from bottom and get up. But at the end of the day, we can't stay at bottom also. We are trying to see in, in, in such an, uh, in a gathering, what are some of the programs, what are some of the, the, the projects coming up maybe ex that we should expect, maybe that might get to our country, maybe that get, can get to other countries that are less connected. Because since Monday, we've been talking about this, and uh, the, the only thing we've been talking about is Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and I think another country, almost seven countries, that are the most connected. Yes, they are the most connected, but they cannot uh, make e-commerce Africa a success. We, we need to all be there. If they are moving us at a certain pace, I think Kenya, we were told that it's at uh, over 80, 80 something percent, but Burundi, we are still at 11 percent. I know Rwanda is, uh, I, I guess, at 9, 12 percent. So where are we going? Are we just making something for five countries, or we want to take this thing general and make it a, a continental thing? And if we want to make it a continental thing, what are some of the joint programs that we have? to foster these skills and how best can we as Africans, let's not go to Google again. <laughs> We're trying to see we as Africans in our specific countries, what are some of the things that we want to do in order for us to connect, not move at the same pace, but at least if Kenya is moving at 85, we should be somewhere at 40. Uh, maybe Burkina Faso should be somewhere at 40, 30 or something. We should try to see how are we going together as Africa in order to develop these skills. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for the question and thanks for the provocation and wake everybody up towards the end. And this is really summarizing the question, I think. We've been talking since Monday and it's Thursday and we've still not fixed it. So uh, there is more to do. I think there's a lot going on, as I think you've seen in the other sessions as well. The work that UNCTAD's been doing on its e-trade readiness reviews is giving country by country a list of things that they need to think about. We also know that African Union level, that the, this is forming part of the debate we were here in July on the relevance of e-commerce at a pan-African level and how that enters into the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So these are just some of the things we also heard about uh, the African group's response at the WTO mm -hmm. to give it a very high level thing is the possibility of Africa being able to negotiate these, these rules if there are to be rules for the first time and having a, a significant voice. I think that Africa does have a significant voice there and we're, we're waiting a little bit for that to come together and speak with one voice clearly about what it wants. These forums have an important input into that. Even if sometimes our conversation can be at a low level about what we're doing in individual companies, I think that that's super important, but we have to integrate back up. So my question a little bit back for you, we're talking about skills. I think we've had a very interesting insight into what it takes at entrepreneurial level, which as I, I repeat, I think is really important because you don't understand this unless you understand what uh, the challenge is as an entrepreneur. But what education would you want to offer to policymakers? Perhaps some are in the room. But do you have suggestions to say, okay, if we could sit you down or ask you to be better informed and capable about something, what would that be? Mm. Because sometimes I think the debate about this is a bit m lacking meaning. What do we mean? You know, is it just digi di digital literacy? Is it something or is there a missing middle about what government needs to understand and, and respond to? Should we come back a little bit to the panel? Thanks. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'll just say it, it, it feels like we're asking a lot of different questions for, for, from a lot of di different approaches. So it, it seems like this is a question about digital inclusion, not about e-commerce, right? I mean, so if the question is what skills are lacking to make a country e-commerce ready, but I, I, I don't know the current situation in Burundi or what the 20 or 80% metric um, that, that you're referring to is, but like maybe the recommendation is if there is a country where mobile adoption is below a certain rate, internet adoption is below a certain rate, willingness to purchase items on internet <laughs> is below a certain rate, then, then yeah. probably do not invest heavily into e-commerce training for SMEs. Right? I mean, v v very, very much, right? Like, I, I, I don't know. So, um, again, you know, it, I think that the initial guiding question of this conversation was, what are the skill gaps related to e-commerce readiness, assuming that e-commerce is a successful pathway to economic development for SMEs? I, I think this, this was the guiding question of this, and, and we've kind of diverged into things about governments building platforms and how they build the platform successfully and whether a country can invest more into digital infrastructure and things like that. And these are all very, very, very important questions, I guess. I would say that, that in the 
evolution or the digital evolution of a country, right? E E-commerce is very far towards the end. I mean, v v very, very much. I mean, That's in terms of effective access to the internet, whether you can consistently like, get access to the internet, whether you, you know how to log onto the internet, are all very, 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 very different forms of training than how you list an item and make it internationally competitive. So maybe the first thing, if, if I were to give guidance to government or <laughs> the United Nations, is to be very realistic and instead of uh, aspirational of like, let us make Africa, an e-commerce powerhouse, and like go to every country and train every SME in every country to be just awesome at e-commerce. Um, it, it just seems, well, very ridiculously expensive. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> or like unlikely to be successful. Yeah. Um, so, so, so probably, maybe t to the question from Brundi would be to very, to, to one, do, do some kind of audit to see what is the current situation in the country, and I is digital key to development? If so, why or how? Right? Like, I, I don't think. I don't think di digital development is any kind of silver bullet, right? Just like you would do any kind of competitive analysis to say, should we invest heavily into industrialization or into, you know, like, <laughs> you know, ocean economy, or should we invest very heavily into coffee or agriculture or, you know, biochemicals or, or whatever else, right? Does our country have a competitive advantage in digital, right? Are, are we able to export digital skills through I don't know, having terrific computer programmers or BPO outsourcing, are there things like that? And if the goal is yes, we, we, we want to pursue that, then obviously there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be set up in terms of broadband or, or whatever else, right? And if the answer is no, then, then uh, I guess understand maybe how digital can be a, a support piece of infrastructure or an ancillary services to key industries within that, that, that country as opposed to saying, no, like, there's a whole economy that is digital. Yeah, yeah, actually it's not a question, but it's just to answer to my brother from Burundi. Actually, I'm from Burundi, but I work in Kigali. And um, uh, I was lucky I got an education, uh, digital marketing education. I have my postgraduate in digital marketing. So uh, what I can say about the digital uh, skills gap, uh, actually, Google, it will be hard uh, to see Google in Burundi or in other country, because sometimes they, they see how many population and also the program that uh, or policy that government has in related, in thing related to digital, things like that. We see that many company and uh, uh, many uh, company like Google, Facebook, you find, you find them in, in Kenya. There is a reason for that, right? So, but just uh, to, uh, to help him or to help other country who uh, may be facing this kind of uh, issue of having those uh, skills, you know? But Google has a uh, Google has a platform called uh, uh, Google Partners. You know, you can uh, uh, try to join to, to to join the Google partnership as a consultant or as a, an agent, and then you have all those skills. They're going to give you a training, training in uh, mobile, yeah, mobile uh, marketing or uh, uh, search marketing and video marketing, and also those are skills that we need. And also uh, in Africa, we have also to see what's our target audience needs, actually, because uh, you, you won't, you never introduce like a, uh, other term, t type of uh, marketing, which is, can say that a uh, higher level in Africa, but you can just see what we need. We see that there are platforms which work well, like Facebook and uh, WhatsApp. We can emphasize, try to master the skills uh, try to master those uh, platforms. So go to Facebook. I know that there is a platform where you can get some skills about uh, uh, Facebook marketing and also Facebook, uh, WhatsApp marketing. Now there are skill, skills, we, uh, there are training, you, you can be trained. So try to go to those platform. As you say, you, is there, we are in Burundi or Ghana or somewhere else, the country which I can say they are marginalized by those uh, uh, company. But right. you can Thank still. You. So, so we understand Google offers some support in. Yeah. Development. You know, I can ask how relevant those are to the environment that we're in, and what else is needed. But anyway, um, in, in terms of, you know, that's all very well for the kind of mm -hmm. education that Google's going to yeah. give. Yeah. But is that mm -hmm. necessary and sufficient? 
Yeah. Okay. And also, maybe you, you have to go through an assessment, which sometimes is very hard, because they're going to assess you to, to access to the training. Okay. But, uh, you know, if you want it, you, there's always, always a way to, to do that. You know. Okay. So I think there was at least one question at the back, so to, to some, sir, there. Thank you for giving me the floor. You've spoken a great deal about Burundi. I'm also from Burundi myself. I represent the government of Burundi. I work at the Ministry of Trade. I want to echo what my compatriots said, but highlighting as well that Burundi has, for the last year, undertaken a survey with UNCTAD to ask for an assessment. Unfortunately, Burundi had, did not win for reasons that you might not be aware of. Uh, they might be political in nature. I would like to highlight the fact that e-commerce is an area which the government is promoting as much as it can despite the lack of a technical and financial assistance from the international organizations. As far as development of skills is concerned, in Burundi, there is um, curriculum vocational training in Burundi. And there's an MSc available as well and ICT is taught, you will understand that there has been commitment, therefore, on the part of the government. However, we require support. All this to support the young man who just spoke. They do require development of their skills for creation and the functioning of the online platforms. These e-commerce platforms do exist online. However, they're still at the embryonic stage. They do require more support as far as the government's concerned. Trade and work online by the government is there. There are many sites that we host. But I just wanted to emphasize the fact that if this study does not take place, if Burundi does not have a national strategy for developing e-commerce, then there's a missing link. I don't know what to do. I would like to call upon the participants for their support so that we can lobby, so that you can assist us to lobby, so that we can have the relevant financing to carry out the relevant studies and inventorize this situation on the ground. There's a great deal that's unknown, statistics that we don't have, data that we require about users, e-commerce, and so we do definitely require support. Thank you. Je vous remercie. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Hello. My name is uh, Kevin. Mine is not necessarily a question, but uh, uh, from uh, what uh, our colleague has talked about, I I'm glad when I hear someone from government advocating on something that uh, supports young people. That's actually really some positive uh, feedback for the people from Burundi. Uh, back to the issue of uh, uh, as to whether e-commerce is uh, critical in uh, supporting uh, the economy of uh, a country, for example. Uh, my thinking rather my assumption is uh, e-commerce and digital go hand in hand, in that uh, for there to be an enabling environment that embraces e-commerce, they have to be digitally aware about what's happening within the electronic space. And uh, probably just to also maybe give uh, my thinking on how young people can advance activities or other agendas towards e-commerce. I sat in a session this morning uh, uh, that's, that was courtesy of uh, the World Economic Forum. And uh, from the high level discussion that was going around there, I figured out there's so much focus on the bottom line. But me as a person, I'm looking at how best can I package e-commerce 
as a, an agenda of advancing social impact. The uh, reason why I'm saying that probably it could be subject to discussion or rather a way to provoke yourself in that when you advance e-commerce within marginalized communities, it means in order for them to engage in business within e-commerce, it's going to be critical in a way that they have requisite skills on digital. So, and um, looking at it, for example, on uh, two, two components, like uh, for me to drive e-commerce on a social impact perspective, I look at it in terms of one, education and business. And uh, for you to even uh, push agenda for SMEs, for example, uh, someone could be driving an SME, which is uh, really a key component on uh, driving business within the online space, but uh, he lacks... Uh, probably just uh, basic skills on how to position his brand online the way I think uh, Brent was mentioning it. Uh, so just as I end is, uh, for me, I believe that e-commerce and digital runs hand in hand, uh, but also there's a whole other element of how best can you look at e-commerce as a social impact perspective in that uh, that also drives agendas within marginalized communities, for example. Uh, but when I, when I refer to marginalized communities, uh, I believe that uh, we are focusing on e-commerce from an urbanized perspective, in that, for example, even success stories for Kenya, for example, Nairobi is a key, is a key region that uh, supports e-commerce. But uh, when you go into the fundamental details, there's still rural communities within our country, despite the successes of M-Pesa, which are still digitally marginalized. So uh, for us to uh, spread across the agenda of e-commerce, even on uh, positioned countries like Kenya, we need to also look at e-commerce as a driver of social impact by taking e-commerce to marginalized communities that are still not accessing digital. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I want to slowly bring the uh, um, discussion to a close. So if there is one more question. I have a question from a woman there. So Please, go ahead. Bonjour. Good afternoon. My name is Fatima Tou. I'm from Conakry. I work for the Ministry of Trade. I would like to thank the panelists for their brilliant presentations. I would like to ask you here, after having heard the representative of the government of Burundi, is it possible to carry out a study focusing on the difficulties encountered in advance by each country? I know that this is a, a tall order, but I think that it would be a useful thing in order to implement e-commerce. The difficulties vary from one country to another due to their specificities. I could state here the raising awareness amongst the population, the rate of literacy, which can be quite high, electricity lacking, electronic payments, the way in which one can pay electronically. Would it not be better to encourage the creation of local platforms taking into account all of those concerns I've just highlighted with the encouragement of the government and the support of the international institutions as well. Thank you. Okay. So something about African solutions. I'm sorry, I'll take one more question and then I'm going to come back to the panelist who's here. So something about appropriate solutions for Africa and whether platforms can, can overcome these infrastructural difficulties of, of electricity and access and so on. So question Hello, I'm Edwin Onyancha. I work for an e-commerce company. So I needed to ask two questions to the panel. And I think they're more, I think we have enough experience. One uh, is how do you deal with abandoned cuts on an e-commerce platform? Secondly, I also wanted to know how you, you deal with online to offline conversion. That is, no matter how hard you work, you have an e-commerce platform, you work so hard to simplify your platform, you have good user experience designers, you have good user interfaces, but 
you still, I mean, based in Kenya, you still find uh, our users, registered users, they still have to call us. They still call us, tell us, say, hey, hey Edwin, uh, I need, get me a TV and a phone. And the customer has already has a phone and they already have a computer. So how will you go about that? Is it more of a culture or is it that uh, we don't have uh, digital skills? Then lastly, uh, for the Burundi team, I think despite the challenges you had, uh, I'm encouraged you still have the effort to come here considering you have, have had you have challenges with the connectivity, the infrastructure wise and the infrastructure. I think it is very encouraging for me. I thought I had a very big challenge, but uh, seeing that you're here, and I think there's a lot to happen for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm stopping the questions there, and I'm going to allow a response from the panel. I, I can share an answer really quickly. <laughs> Abandon cart, remarketing campaigns. Uh, Remarketing campaign is essentially uh, a remarketing campaign is where you can set up cookies on your site that identify the actions that people take. So you can say if there's an action where a person puts something in a cart and then does not transact, i.e. doesn't see any kind of like payment confirmation page, um, most advertising platforms, Facebook, Google, whatever else, have stuff set up where you can remarket as in show advertisements to that specific audience of users. Second thing that I would suggest you do if you have a large abandoned cart issue is probably put some way for a customer to give you feedback on that cart page, right? So it could be a box where a person could submit a question at this point, right? Because maybe they're dropping off because they have a problem with payment or whatever, and, and you might not know about it. Otherwise, go into logs in order to identify them. So maybe those three things. And then um, online to offline, um, I, I think it's just the nature of this country. Um, so I, I, I work here in Kenya as well. Um, I think there are customers that just aren't comfortable enough with e-commerce yet, so you'll have to make a decision of either you want to service those customers, in which case you will need some capacity to take phone calls yeah. or meet them in person or whatever else, or, you, or it's not cost-effective to work with those customers, um, and then they will go to a platform where they are able to make phone calls or see it in person. Like even Jumia is setting up physical stores where literally the purpose of the store is to sit with the person and help them make an order online mm. because you, they, they could do it themselves. They own a computer, they own an internet, but like you will not change user behavior that quickly. Yes, also I'm of the view that we should accept the fact that e-commerce cannot survive without the traditional way of marketing and transaction. Whether we like it or not, however fast the world is moving, that's the standard. Before you connect with someone on an e-commerce platform, before you do WhatsApp business, before you do Facebook pages and everything and promotions, one has got to understand you as a person or because some people support because they know you as an individual, you know? So I, I want to believe that that connection with your customers, physical connection, yes? Sometimes you just have to check on them traditionally without having to tell them to buy this or that. Yes, phone calls are very relevant. Remembering people's birthdays is a way of making them feel special, yes? These are very small things, but they're things that actually contribute to how a customer feels about you. And then also the fact that people have already so many platforms they are using. Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest. By the time they come to your e-commerce platform to install it, first of all, on their phones, it really has got to have something more than just the products on sale, okay? So we need to appreciate the traditional way of doing things first, understand our customers, customer service. How do you engage with customers in the physical? That way they'll be able to subscribe to your e-commerce platform when the time comes and you have it. Yes, yeah, so we need to start from the traditional way of doing things, then we can promote that to whenever we get the e-commerce platforms, yes. Yeah. So for us, how we encountered a button cut was one, relevance of the content. Sometimes we do ads where you're selling apples and stuff, and guys will click the ad, and they'd come to our website, and they'd expect us to sell Apple products, you know, iPhones and stuff, so relevance. So guys would show up and they'd be like, oh, this is Apple's fruits, not Apple products, and then they'll drop off. So what we did is track in that. Second is uh, set up the cookies and all, and the live chat support. So for us, we have live bots on the checkout page. If someone stays on the checkout page for more than 30 seconds, customer bot will ping them and have a conversation with them, just on the customer journey. 
And third, as Adam was saying, you know, like retargeting and remarketing. You have to understand the customer journey. For us, we figured out that people would come to our website even for three months without buying anything, and then just to see the consistency of the messaging and the products, and then they'll be triggered to actually purchase something. So it's just understanding that journey and knowing that it will take time. Online to offline, uh, I've seen how China does it. It's about providing offline experiences. Uh, if you go to, for example, so Alibaba bought this chain of shops called HemoFresh. And when you're there, people touch things, people look at things, there are no cashiers in the supermarket. You buy products on your phone, check out on your phone, leave the supermarket, and they'll do the delivery after. So you're not carrying stuff. So people come in, look at things, and how we've been able to do it for us, it's a trust issue. Uh, people are buying meat on our platform, for example. Imagine meat, this is something that is so sensitive, that is so personal to a lot of people. They wanna see how you're packaging it, uh, where you're sourcing it from. So people come there just to look at who are you as people, uh, to understand your processes, to see your physical location, build that trust, then start shopping online. So what we did was, the first probably 1,000 deliveries we did, I delivered to the customer in person. Uh, they see me, they see the products, we are doing cash on delivery, they only paid after they saw the product. And uh, it was hard for us and we lost a lot of money in the start, but the, la the first six months, customers were even paying on credit before we started doing like digital uh, processing for money because someone wants to experience the product and if they're happy with it, then they'll keep shopping. So you have to be innovative in how you do it, but also just what uh, Stella was saying, a lot of traditional, it's still marketing, still retail at the end of the day. So old wine, new bottle, how do you sell the old wine? So I'd say refer to that as much. Okay, so thanks. So I'm gonna bring the event to a close there. We're at time. So I'm gonna um, um, make a, you know, a few observations. So we've made a journey of this large animal that is skills. We've heard from entrepreneurs here, admittedly in one of the more developed countries in Africa, in Kenya, about the journey that they've made. Now that's not to say, as we heard, that the only story about e-commerce is the big countries in Africa. I think what that shows is inspirational examples of what's possible. And we were reminded, I think, by Adam and from others about the about the education that we have to have the awareness raising to policymakers and being realistic about what e-commerce can do. You know, we, we may have this dream about opening up new channels for commerce for small producers, but they need to be taken on a journey. So we heard the passionate interventions from Burkina Faso about the work that they're doing, and also Burundi, I think there were several comments about starting from a lower level. But this is possible, the digital revolution can happen fast, but we have to be realistic with it. The good news is that perhaps we've got time to build in those countries the basic skills, perhaps in different things. It is a different context, but digital literacy, we have to educate from the top, the policymakers about what, what they can be doing and what they can be doing to prepare for this. We, um, we heard about the, on, uh, the, the journey that entrepreneurs need to make. Now, admittedly, these were a couple of very telling examples from Kenya about the ability to change a business plan, to hear about startup in one business, and to understand and change. That's already an advanced uh, set of skills to see an opportunity. We have even have a discussion at the end there, which is very interesting, about customer service attitudes and being flexible, about payment, payment mechanisms, for instance. Africa has an admired position in mobile money, for instance, but those, those innovations are, uh, are, are very enabling. Uh, but more needs to be done about, about uh, financial inclusion, education about what that means. And this big issue of trust, of building trust at all levels, there are different aspects to trust. The government in this as a tool, uh, the, the payment mechanism about how platforms work. So the, there's, a, there's a challenge at different levels about building skills. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna bring the discussion to us. I'm only sad to say that we didn't get to talk about rabbits a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I was a bit worried that, that, that uh, despite um, the, the failure of this marketplace, we've gone on to, to develop other kinds of, you know, selling meat online. Um, but with that, the, the rabbits get to live for another day. The e-commerce continues and grows. Thank you very much. Oh, I should retell this, an important uh, document. If some of you want a copy of this, or even the master report on an ITC uh, document on uh, business ecosystems for the digital age, work of our SME competitiveness work. 
You can come and see me afterwards and I can give you a very nice uh, sample of this uh, for you to take home and read on some of the work of my colleagues in building effective ecosystems in which to promote the digital age. And that is a contribution to this debate about what government, governments need to do. Very happy to give you a copy of it. Um, see me afterwards. Thank you very much. We'll see you at the afternoon sessions. Enjoy your lunch.